Welcome back to Northern Perspective, everyone. I'm Cypher. And I'm Fox. A few days ago, two of the three implicated organizations within the Arrive Can scandal testified before committee. Those were Coradex, or Coradex, uh, Dalian, which, let's face it, is really one organization, and they pretend to be two. The third organization, GC Strategies, was also invited by committee to come testify, but were doing everything they could to avoid doing so. In response, Stephanie Cousy of the Conservatives decided to put a stop to that right then and there and issue a formal summons from committee. A formal summons mandates that GC Strategies had to attend and answer some questions. We have not seen this yet, so please no spoilers or reaction and commentary to, uh, to this will be authentic and live. If you are watching this after the fact, we suggest you watch our running series on this entitled Scammed on Arrival, which can be found in the description. Now, please note, unlike our normal live stream, we will not be meeting in Discord after the stream or responding to questions aside from Super Chats as we anticipate the stream to run for approximately at least three hours. Uh, before we get started, a few housekeeping items. I know on our last uh, live stream, a few people had asked us to do the slow chat. Um, so the thing I learned about slow chat is it um, only slows down the chat for people who are not members. And considering I think more than half of our viewers are members at this point, um, I didn't see a point in um, using the slow chat because I think it would just punish the people who weren't members um, and we don't want that. So um, unfortunately, we cannot apply slow chat to our, our live chat, um, so please keep that in mind. And another thing that we've done is we've changed Barnaby's tag because I noticed that um, it was too similar to ours, so we were getting tagged instead of him and a lot of questions were getting missed. So now if you want to tag Barnaby, who is with us tonight, you can just type at B-A-R-N and Barnaby from Northern Perspective should pop right up. And uh, just to get them out of the way, thank you very much to Construction Cronies for the, uh, uh, for the two $10 Super Chats. Uh, Jarsha for the $50 Super Chat. Thank you very, very much. Um, what Jarsha had said uh, was, just want to say that CPC has a bunch of top-notch team right now. Brock, Genuous, Lloyd, Kusi, Chong, Shear, Dancho, etc. To say nothing of Polly Evan Lanceman. If, they were, if there were a fantasy football of... <laughs> Canadian politics. That's the dream team right there. Um, sure is. I can't say yep. any, any And don't forget that. Cooper, though. Don't forget don't Cooper. Don't forget Cooper. Yeah. <laughs> and the Conservative cronies uh, doing good work here. Thank you so much. Uh, welcome to Jarsha's NP supporter, and thank you very much to Humble Tracker for the uh, 10 memberships before the stream even begun. I understand she's out of, pro out of country, and we very much appreciate her support. So, without further ado, let's do it. the meeting um we're waiting for mr this is Anthony really quiet to fix a zoom but i think we're gonna get started anyways because we have uh, mr first's opening statement so hopefully we'll uh i'll have mr anthony in by then so i call this meeting to order welcome to meeting number 83 the house of the commons of this, standing committee this on government the, uh, operations and feed. estimates Pursuant to Standing Order 1082 and the motion adopted by the Committee on Monday, October 17, 2022, the Committee meeting is on the study of the ArriveCan application. Reminder not to have your earpieces near your microphones as it causes feedback and potential injury. Now, in accordance with our routine motion, letting everyone in the Committee know that the witnesses so far appearing by video conference have completed the required connection tests. In advance of Kelly the McConnell meeting. Show, he always so, Mr. Firth, we will turn things right over the for you begins. for five minutes. Please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good afternoon. I am grateful to finally have the opportunity to correct the mistakes, omissions, and falsehoods that have been voiced at and by this committee and in the newspapers over the past number of weeks. The first one is in respect to my summons. I readily accepted the committee's invitation to appear, as I did last year when I was the first to show up and testify for over two hours. I told the committee that, because of parenting responsibilities this week, I could be available for one hour, but the, in the, but the committee preferred the two hours I'd be available the following week. But this was portrayed as a reluctant witness and playing hard to get. This is actually far from the truth. Without this opportunity to appear here today, GC strategies would continue to be bound to confidentiality with Butler 
that was conveniently presented to me for signature right before they started feeding the media with information. It wasn't out of choice that GC Strategies remained silent after learning of the numerous allegations made by Butler, especially being on the other side with contradicting information. I welcome the opportunity to again explain my business and the contracting processes for government departments that have existed for several decades. The system has outsourced many contracting functions to the private sector. I was not around when this was established, but presumably the belief was that a competitive private sector could operate better than an inc increased bureaucracy. Okay, so before we get any further in this statement, I found it interesting that he's referring to being bound by privacy by the, the Botler duo, the dynamic duo, as we we're starting to call them. Um, so typically what happens in arrangements like this is organizations sign with each other something called an, N M an NDA or MNDA. So an NDA stands for a non-disclosure agreement. A MNDA stands for a mutual non-disclosure agreement. An NDA is typically presented to protect one organization's privacy or intellectual property. You'll also hear that referred to as IP sometimes. And it's usually there's only one organization with risk in that. And um, an MNDA is usually when there's intellectual proper, property potentially on in both organizations that are at risk. So in that case, both organizations will actually sign that, which bind both organizations to, uh, to a non-disclosure agreement as it relates to what's in the contract. So just some context there. I would be very interested to see the NDA that, uh, that Christian is putting forth that they were bound by to actually see exactly what that covered. Because I have a feeling it didn't cover everything that uh, he's, quote-unquote, not allowed to talk about. Anyway, that's just some context for everybody. Um, and before we go back to the video, uh, we want to thank Glenn Stewart for $10 Super Chat. says, keep rocking with such zeal. We will. Excellent. Well, let's see how, uh, how much zeal Christian has in his uh, remaining statement. The system provides that only qualified private sector vendors can bid on and receive government contracts. Becoming a qualified private sector vendor is not easy or quick, as many checks for security and reliability are required. GC Strategies has been a qualified vendor since 2015. There are between 600 and 700 such qualified vendors in Canada, competing on a daily basis to provide services to government departments and agencies. These vendors range from very large companies who do work in-house to smaller vendors such as us who put teams together on a case-by-case -case basis. This competitive system forces qualified vendors to continually deliver quality services at competitive rates, or they would simply not be able to secure work. Because we rely on teams on a case-by-case -case basis, it is imperative that we cultivate relationships with service providers and advance their interests. If he thinks $54 million for a mobile app is a competitive rate, I don't know what he's smoking, everybody, but clearly he should start selling that instead of apps. But we also need to maintain connections with departments to understand their needs and understand where the market is heading. That is my business and I'm proud of it, as I'm sure all other vendors in Canada are proud of theirs. You may not like the system that is in place. You might think the government can do the better job themselves. You may not respect our work, and that is your right. I, like all people running a business, make mistakes. We try to learn from our mistakes, but in all honesty, we'll likely make more. GC Strategies made a mistake by sending the wrong version of the resume in which turned ended up being submitted to the government of Canada for the task authorization. Wrong Wait. version? What? What? Wrong version. Listen, a wrong version <laughs> has, like has a less experience. Yeah. No, a wrong version has less experience. <laughs> okay? A wrong version of a resume has less experience. A wrong version of a resume doesn't have 10 times the experience you're purporting to have on the original resume. What are you talking about? Okay, so that right then and there, we have an inadvertent, maybe, inadvertent admission from GC Strategies that they doctored the resumes. So check off identity theft as the first crime admitted by GC Strategies. Okay, I'm sure Brock and, and the team are, are crossing that off their list. However, this regrettable mistake was not intentional and no way determined the awarding of the contract. In short, the CBSA had pre-qualified the owners of Bottler to do the work as they were the only two resources with knowledge of their software. Bottler was approved before any resume was submitted 
or task authorization created. This is all relevant to the specific events surrounding partner. That's also against government computer, uh, procurement process, which is publicly available for all to see. So what's supposed to happen is the government decides they want to do a project. And let's say they want to do a project to introduce a mobile app that can combat sexual harassment in the workplace, which is what the Butler folks were known for doing in public. So what they would have to do is put together a RFP proposal that they would send through the government procurement machine that would then be posted. And if they had a preferred vendor, they could send that to the preferred vendor, which Bottler would probably be one of them, but they would then have to find a competing vendor. If they couldn't, they would have to justify in the selection process of Bottler why they couldn't find a competing vendor. Okay. And then what would have to happen is a scope of work would be drawn it, as a result of the RFP that Bottler would have responded to a contract drawn up. And if required resumes of the individuals, in this case, Miss Dutt and Mr. Morv, they would be submitted. And then background checks would be run. Fingerprint identification would be run. All of that comes back clear then CBSA and Bottler would have signed a contract. GC Strategies would have signed the contract as well, being the agent who found them. And then everyone would be holding hands in this engagement. That's what's supposed to happen. What he's describing is not what's supposed to happen. Bottler was a client I recruited because I thought they could fill an important need for the government's compliance with Bill C-65. I thought their specific product would be useful for many departments, I spent the better part of two years working with them and introducing them to various departments. CBSA was one of them, but there were many more. I was even working with Bottler to get them qualified as a vendor so they could fulfill contracts directly, How nice eliminating the need for vendors like GC Strategies. The Bottler pilot was delivered delivery-based, so Bottler would only get paid when they delivered. They delivered the first two deliverables and then were paid everything they were owed. At no time did GC Strategies ever receive money for those deliverables that we did not immediately pass on to Bottler. Bottler stopped delivering what was required of them and CBSA terminated the contract. I was asked to gather all new work that was done from Bottler prior to termination and submit to CBSA for review and payment. Nearly two months passed. At that point, Bottler submitted the remaining four deliverables along with an invoice. The deliverables were then submitted to CBSA and they were not approved. The documents were unreadable and once a version came through they could evaluate, the CBSA determined the work to be substandard and they were refused to pay. That leads us here today. So let me be clear. The Bottler pilot project was no way connected to ArriveCan. GC Strategies made no money whatsoever after working with Bottler for two years, including the pilot. GC Strategies and Dallin and Karadix each had their own individual contracts to complete work on ArriveCan. At no point did GC Strategies work with or act as a subcontractor on Dallin or Karadix's contract for ArriveCan. All work done for ArriveCan app by GC Strategies was done using our own contract. Thank you. So if you recall in Bottler's initial testimony, they did actually state that they had completed the work because they were trying to get paid. They were trying to talk to CBSA to actually get the money. And CBSA said, well, you need to complete your del deliverables. And they stated, well, we have. Give us our money. The problem was, is no one was paying them. Now, he's trying to say, Christian, that this is in no way connected with the Rive Camp. Well, maybe the work. But the problem is, is it seems like the money that Bottler was paid with was paid out of the Arrive Can fund as a result of a task authorization initiated by TBSA. Now, remember, a task authorization is a way to kind of circumvent the RFP process. It executes a task of the... Um, of an existing contract that the government already had with Dalian and Cordex, probably for a block of development hours associated with ArriveCan, or could even be associated not with ArriveCan. ArriveCan was probably a task authorization as well, from what we understand. Anyhow, um, this is just a complete mess, and 
it sounds like the same funds that were paid for ArriveCan were the same funds that a task authorization was issued to Bottler. Completely improper to the government procurement process. So we have a $2 super chat from Hugh Jass, which looks like the Hugh Jass from The Simpsons when that prank call backfired on Bart, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Hugh Jass says, the bottler did it in the lounge with the wrench. Those Very sneaky nice. people. And I see we have 576 watching and only 305 likes. Get those likes up, people. Let's, Let's go. push this out so every Canadian can see this. Thank you very much. We'll start with six minutes with Mr. Brock. Mr. Barrett. Well, thanks very much, uh, Chair. Um, to the witness, the name of your company is GC Strategies. Is that correct? Yes, it is. How many staff work at GC Strategies? <laughs> we have two employees, but we outsource our finance you, and legal. Um, app programming or design? No, we do not. So your role in terms of IT contracts for the federal government is that you're the middleman between the government and the people who do the work. Is that correct? Well, we also, we are responsible for bringing in individuals and building teams that the federal government would not have access to <laughs> as they do not have them on staff and they also do not have recruitment capabilities. Right. So in short, I'm trying to say that we do a lot more work than we actually do because we're only two people. We just collect millions of dollars of taxpayer money. That's basically what he's trying to say. So the answer to Barrett's question is, yes, that's exactly what we are. We're just the middleman. Uh, I mean, the recruitment capabilities of direct messaging people on, on LinkedIn, it, I mean, <laughs> I, I'm sure a value could be ascribed to that. And actually, we're going to see what that value is. You worked on the $54 million ArriveCan app. Is that correct? Yes, it is. And that app, the work on that app is now under RCMP investigation. Is that correct? Not that I'm aware of. What? Not that you're aware of? Is that a quote-unquote not that I can recall type answer? You, you, you purport to be plugged into the government and plugged in to the information technology realm where you staff firms and you are not aware that the RCMP, the RCMP is investigating one of the products that you advertise on your website, GC Strategies, as something that you built and you're not aware of the RCMP investigation? That's pretty serious. <laughs> Sorry, but bullshit. Absolute bull. You're going to have a rocky time if, if you're lying already, Christian. Holy moly. You're not aware of of the RCMP investigating any of the work related to GC strategies uh, or um, anyone that you've done, any of your, you were contracted by or subcontracted to? That's correct. I, my understanding was in the testimonies that I've heard and was clarified by some people, some honorable members that right now RCMP is only investigating the Butler accusations and not arrive camp. Okay, so did you work with Butler? I've worked with Butler for two years as their representation and we were in partnership. Okay. And, uh, and how much money did you, have you made so far with uh, contracts with the Government of Canada? Uh, I'm sorry, I do not have that notice. Those numbers in front of me, I wasn't prepared for that question. My you, apologies. You, you weren't prepared? Oh, I'm prepared for that question. Hold on. I'm very prepared for that question. Stand by, everybody. I am very, very prepared for that question. Funny how I'm prepared to report on this guy's finances. And he is not... Isn't that interesting? Well, let's just see then, shall we? Arrive, can... Well, Cypher's looking for that. We've got 425 likes and 625 watching. That means we're 200 likes behind. Hit that like button for us. We need to push the stream out so every single Canadian in this country sees it. Alrighty. So, um, if we were to do this roughly... We have, let's see, 5, 12, 24. Uh, it, looks like, it looks like GC Strategies is around $40 million. $40 million they've made off of the Government of Canada contracts. So if I can find that in two seconds, this guy who manages his own business, he should have that off the top of his head considering the government is probably his biggest client. $40 million dollars since 2015 
GC strategies from not the government, our wallets, everybody. That's our tax paper money. Right, because the government does not have its own money. They take it from us. Prepared to tell the committee uh, when we're here to ask you about your contracts with the government, um, how much you've been paid by the government for your contracts? <laughs> well, this is the Arrive Can application study. This isn't contracting with GC strategies in the federal government study. Wow. I, I, I mean, I've already given off all the information I have for the application for Arrive Can, which is the base of the study. I've had two hours of testimony. I've given hundreds of pages of documentation. Right. And, and we're and awaiting so you, you an order to be, You had to be summoned to appear here today, sir, and you don't even have the basic details about the work that you've done for the government. Smack How much money there. was GC Strategies paid to not do any programming or app design for the Arrive Can app? Wow. Well, first, I think I clarified in my opening statement the reason I was not the reason why I was summoned was because one hour I, was not sufficient I, I heard your today opening statement, sir. Hours. My question is with respect to your billing for ArriveCan. Mm -hmm. Can you repeat the question, please? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're like 10 minutes in. <laughs> and Barrett is letting him have it you know, now. I, I love Michael Barrett because he's savage, but he's like a polite kind of savage. Oh, like, yeah. Yeah, like he, he's ruthless, but, but he's charming about it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. How much... Did you get paid for your work on ArriveCan? I, I, sorry, I, I've already given up all this information. That you have all of my invoices. Sir, are you refusing to, the to answer the question? It's a very straightforward question. As you said, this is a study about ArriveCan. <laughs> it seems to me that it would be quite pertinent for you to be able to tell the committee how many millions of dollars you were paid with your two-person company to do work on an app that you didn't do any programming for. How much money? Okay, so this is a little confusing why he's doing this why Christian is doing this because he testified a year ago on this as he stated um, I've watched some of that and he did state in that meeting how much they made the only reason that I can surmise as to why he doesn't want to talk about that publicly now is because of the firestorm that's going on and he doesn't want it on record of this committee. But it doesn't matter because they could go back if they really wanted to to the publications and look what that is. I believe they got paid, it was somewhere in the, it was like eight or nine million dollars over two years. And before we get back to the video, we have Jer Savoy with a $2 super chat. Wish Rob Moore will be the chair, not the vice chair. Yeah, agreed. And we also have 515 thumbs up and 691 watching. So please, please give us a thumbs up. It helps YouTube push out the stream so more Canadians can see it. If you like this breakdown, then hit the like button so YouTube can suggest it to more people so they can hear the breakdown as well. I am more than happy that once I get that number to give you the answer in writing. Wow. I don't have that number with me right now, the exact dollars and cents, apologies. So if I said the number was $9 million, you wouldn't be able to dispute that? No, I can dispute that. Okay, so what, uh, with, can, with what, I can with tell what you number? It I can tell you it wasn't nine. I, again, you, what? it's been publicized in the media. It's somewhere between 15 and 30%. That's the number that everybody's going with. Okay. So it's, it's um, quite interesting that you, you're, you're not interested in sharing the number because uh, of the amount of work that was not done by you on the app and the amount of money that you collected for work that was done on the app. Are you familiar with the testimony that was given, um, uh, that you gave at this committee? You talked about your previous appearance. Um, it's like I'm in sync Where you with talked Barrett. about relationships. So I'm gonna ask you, do you use relationships to get work from the government of Canada? I I actually, it, my relationships are gained from meetings that I've had since 2009 with multiple clients. We go through a competitive process to win business, like every other one of the six or 700 vendors that go do the same thing. But you just said that it wasn't a competitive process for Bottler. You literally said that in your opening statement. Five, 10 minutes in and you're already contradicting yourself. This is not going to go well for you, Christian. Well, and also, Christian has no idea how much money that GC Strategies uh, got last year from the government, but Fox does. Last year, they were reported to be paid $9 million, and it was updated to $11 million this year, according to The Globe. Before we continue with the video, we want to say thank you to Kevin Taylor for a $10 super chat. Keep this amazing content coming. You guys are killing it. 
Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you to David Edwards for $5 super chat. Barrett at the end of this meeting, let's go, uh, let's go all of all politeness and let's him have it. Oh, we said no spoilers. Come on. Come on. Although I am looking forward to that. And we also say thank you to Glenn Stewart for $2 super chat. Must be a liberal. <laughs> so is your, is your client list relationship based? My client list is people that I continue to have meetings with from when I first made, picked up the phone for a cold call and still have to this today. So we've heard testimony at this committee that, um, that you leveraged relationships with key people in the government in order to uh, guarantee business, and that's how you solicited the uh, participation of subcontractors. Is that a fair characterization? That's accurately what your testimony is. You've heard, but that's not what happened. You're, 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 you're making reference to a testimony and taking that as gospel. Actually, he's not. Um, and the fact that you're insinuating that and you're getting defensive about it is actually illustrating a lot, Christian. What Barrett said is what we've heard is this. Is that an accurate characterization? That's what he's saying. He's actually asking you if that's valid. Now, you're assuming that Barrett is coming at you, which let's be honest, he is, but you're assuming he's coming at you believing that over anything that you would actually say and you're getting really defensive about it. I want to say thank you to Office Girl for a $5 super chat. I would pay you $9 million, but you actually do work. Thank you. <laughs> Plus, I don't think uh, YouTube would actually authorize a super chat that large. So. Also, I don't think the government would pay us $9 million for trash talking them like this. <laughs> and we also want to say thank you to David Edwards with a $2 super chat. Sorry. Uh, that's okay. We forgive you. So you're saying that the witnesses lied to the committee? No, I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying that the reason we... like. The business came about was as again having relation having meetings with continuously having meetings and identifying opportunities and actually being ahead of it getting uh partnerships with people understanding where the market is going and being able to use procurement processes to get them in with while staying within psvc guidelines so that's a problem for christian because he didn't refute the testimony that's a problem big problem in a way that's inadvertently or indirectly admitting that how the previous witnesses, which is the Butler crew, characterized the way he uh, um, achieved business within the government was by relationships primarily. So he didn't refute that. That's going to be a problem. Uh, sir, you've, you've said in relationship to, uh, in reference to your relationship with Mr. McDonald, that you've been with him his whole career in government. Is that correct? That was an embellishment. Em an, embellishment by, an embellishment by you? Correct. So while we sell to the federal government, I also have to sell to my uh, clients. So by, se be the, by, by, the, selling, like the, by selling, you, you lie to them. <laughs> wow. Oh, Barrett. Wow. Get him. Absolutely. And here's the, here's the interesting thing. Okay, so let's just do a recap here. So Christian Firth has no idea how much money his company has made from the federal government. He has no idea how much he is, his company has made from the Arrive uh, Can app, but he is very astutely aware that a leaked recording of a conversation that he had with uh, the Bottler crew was out there on the internet. It had him stating that he said that, so he knows he can't deny that. And furthermore, lying about influence is still a criminal offense called frauds on government under Section 121. So there, there you, go. you go. Before we continue, another $2 super chat from Hugh Jass. Thank you. Odds on whether this is the current fall guy. He's one of them, but uh, he, he can't be the only one because the, the other the, there's a big problem for the government. Um, and that starts with cameron mcdonald but it also be it continues with john oswowski it also continues with marco mendicino who the bottler crew testified received an email to this effect and it also includes all of these other people that christian firth is connected to so the question is is when is christian firth going to start 
going to stop trying to protect his own butt and start throwing mud at other people in order to misdirect people away from his own corruption and involvement in this matter? That's my real question. Katie Cat with a $7 super chat. Thank you for the spontaneous live stream. Watched this earlier and it was so good that I had to watch it again with all my Northern Perspective friends. Oh, thanks, Katie Cat. It's always more fun doing recordings with all of you live. And we've got 765 people watching and 613 likes. Please hit that like button. I will stop bothering you when those two numbers match. We'll stick our members on you. Come on, guys. Let's get it going. No, no, that's not necessarily the truth. That, that it was, is our, uh, any... Sorry, that is our time. Uh, Mr. Jouari, please. Oh, sorry, Kelly's Mr. So sweet. Chuck, please, for six minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Firth, uh, in a lot of the conversations that we've had here um, on this issue the last number of days, um, there's been some conflation, uh, conflating of uh, Butler AI and and uh, and the arrive can uh, you guys app are still work. gonna take this, uh, this again can you just yes. state um, did yeah, you engage is. with uh, Butler AI on any uh, arrive can work they were completely independent okay so you were working with them on the uh, on the Butler AI app is that correct yeah, I was I was representing them as my client, and I was working with them on, not just on the Butler pilot, but continuously trying to get them new meetings and get them in different departments. What does that mean, representing them? Help me understand uh, that. What that means? Yes. Yeah. So it's a partnership. I may uh, we we agreed into we decided after many meetings and conversations, we went into partnership where they identified me, they wrote scripts for me um, as being a partner and representing them for business development in. Uh, for government of Canada clients. Is that a formal partnership? Is there an agreement of some sort, a contract that goes into that partnership? Or I'm going to say no. I'm going to say no because I distinctly remember the Butler crew saying they did not have a contract with GC Strategies. They did not have a contract of CBSA. They did not have a contract with Dalian. The only contract that seemed to be in existence was between Dalian and the government of Canada. So before we go forward, uh, Wesley Henry with a $28 super chat. Keep up the great work exposing the corrupt liberals. Thank you so much, Wesley. We intend to do so. And Lightgiver with a $50 super chat. Thank you so much. I watched this earlier. Hopefully you will get the joke. Swiss chalet. Okay. Okay. We'll try and remember that. Thank you so much. Or is that no, a I mean, handshake? It was trust. I mean, I, I worked for two years for no fee, for no retainer, and actually for nothing. Um, and the fact that this was, I mean, there's there's emails back and forth where I have scripts created by Butler that they'd like me to use when I'm introducing myself and how the partnership is set up. There's my logo on presentations where it's clearly where they've built this as in partnership with. So I've heard of retainers with organizations that actually do work. I've never heard of retainer. It doesn't mean they don't exist, but I've never heard of a retainer with a staffing firm. That doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, like I've heard of a retainer with a lawyer, but you don't you don't give money to a staffing firm. Like that 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 doesn't make any sense. That that would be a kind of like a backwards business arrangement. If you're a staffing firm, then you staff. Yeah, because usually with staffing firms, they take a cut of the contract, or um, I, they usually they usually take about twenty percent of the contract, or. There's a finder's fee in which the client, meaning the organization soliciting the talent, doesn't want to pay the continual um, exorbitant fee that the staffing agencies charge over and above the regular hourly rate of the employee. So they pay a finder's fee, which is typically 20% of the first year annual salary. That's kind of what happens. Humble Tracker with a $50 super chat. Thank you so much. Last minute donation, 8 o'clock where I am at the moment. Sorry, I can't be around for a while. No problem. Thank you very much for your, your generosity, Humble Tracker. And a $13.99 super chat from Sean. Hit the like button or Trudeau will win the next election. There, that should work <laughs> like they do. Yeah, I don't think Trudeau has a snowball's chance in hell of winning the next election. But just in case, just in case. Make sure like, you hit that like button. Just like just inflation, just in case, hit the like button. Is it normal to enter into these kinds of partnerships? I mean, usually no. when I see businesses, there's a formal agreement. Let me answer for them. Spells out exactly what the expectations are, exactly what the compensation is. 
Was there ever such a document in, in this case? No, I mean, it was, it was built a lot on trust. Um, the reality is I, it's hard to go into agreement when nothing has been, when initially you haven't set up a meeting. So we just went off trust and we were partners and it kind of worked, it worked out. That doesn't make sense. Okay, so so according to the Globe and Mail story, which they the Globe and Mail worked with Botler on this, Christian reached out to Botler. Botler was just doing their own thing. Christian reached out to them and said, my client is interested in what you're doing. He works for the CBSA. They're interested in what they're doing. Okay, so that, that lines up with the business model of what GC Strategies does. And he's trying to say that what Botler and GC Strategies just found each other and you know had a hug and started a, a business relationship based on a handshake and a coffee. Give me a break. From the perspective of understanding that you know they were represented, they got a pilot and they got paid. Uh, why did the CBSA terminate the contract for uh, Botler AI in December 2021? I'm, I'm, I can't speculate. I'm sorry. I wasn't part of that decision making. Did you have a contract with CBSA for Bottler AI? Sorry, I'm stopping this so much, but this guy is just, <laughs> he's not making sense at all. Um, so he was boasting about the fact that he was partners. He was partners with the Bottler crew for two years and they worked all that time without, without getting paid and without a retainer. You were partners and you don't know why CBCA ter terminated the contract. Some partner you are. What's wrong with you? No, I didn't. That was with Dylan and Karatix. Dylan, okay. And you have no understanding of why uh, that, uh, that was terminated? No. How many deliverables were expected of Butler AI under that project? Seven. Six. And how many did they Six. deliver? Six, yes, six. They delivered two and got full payment for two. Okay. What was and what was you mentioned something in your earlier testimony about the quality of work? Can you speak to that a little bit? The quality of Butler's work? I, I think so. I believe I, that's what yeah. I heard in your yep. testimony. So, so the first the first two deliverables were of standard, and the CBSA approved them and signed off and paid. The other four were ones that came two months after they were asked to hand over everything that had been delivered up to that point. There was silence for those two months. There was then four months, the four deliverables were then sent in in February. At that point, the CBSA, A, they couldn't read them to start with. And then secondly, when they asked for a format they could read, it came back that they decided it was substandard and they would not release payment. Just to clarify as well, too, the, the first two that they did get paid for, that was also deemed substandard work and CBSA no, no. still... No, no, sorry, I, I apologize. Yep, no, th those two were accepted. That's why CBSA paid for it. Liberals being so nice to him. So it was the remaining four that were substandard, is that correct? Correct. Was there ever an expectation uh, on your part and Butler's part that this pilot pilot project would lead to a government-wide acceptance uh, of, uh, of, of Butler AI, which would lead to a, a, a contract, as I understand it, in previous testimony that could have been north of $20 million. Was there an expectation of that uh, at uh, GC Strategies and also Butler AI at yes. any point? It was on your that recording. That this would lead to a larger contract in the uh, millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars. Better say yes. That would be naive of me to expect that. I mean, I've been doing this now for, for close to 20 years. And an enterprise sale for the federal government is it's very, very rare. Um, the truth was we were trying to make steps to at least be considered. So it's, you know, get yourself a pilot, get yourself in other departments so you can at least start getting momentum. You have a pathfinder. And at that point, there's, there's got to be a threshold once you've in enough departments where it's cheaper to do an enterprise license with, at a volume discount than it is to keep paying the licensing fee. But there's there's never a promise of of an enterprise purchase. It's that would be naive of me to say that because I just know how much work goes into that and what has to happen. Well, see, that's kind of a problem. You should have said yes, because that's what you were saying in that recording, if I remember correctly, to the Butler folks that was released to the public. Because you were saying Oh, I can get you in front of this uh, person. I can get you in front of that person. And uh, our 
our expectation is 20% and yada, 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 yada. Before we continue, we want to say thank you to Just44 for a $6.99 super sticker. And thank you to Chloe for a $2.79 super chat, a first super chat. Uh, thank you. It says, keep up the good work. Y'all y'all are amazing. Awesome. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Why were you trying to, why were you working with Butler AI? Uh, what was the motivation to work with them for two years without any formal mm -hmm. agreement? Well, I mean, right at that time, there were um, cases, uh, civil suits and, and like harassment cases being settled by the uh, armed forces for 900 million. There was RCMP were making settlements for 100 million for misconduct and harassment. And there had to be, this could have been an opportunity for all government employees to have a front line where they could have um, somebody to, you know, a bot or something to speak to and, and identify what the problems were and at least have some sort of sound voice to actually go up against. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kuzmirchuk. Uh, Ms. Vignola for six and a half minutes, please. Or six minutes, please. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. She's been pretty direct previously. This should be interesting. Mr. Firth. As my colleague mentioned, there can be some confusion between the contract for Butler AI on harassment and Arrive Cam. But we just want to understand your main role in all of this. I would like to know for Arrive Cam, did you work directly with Leon Karadis? No, I did not. I, I had never worked with uh, Dalian and Karadix at all on any Arrive Can work. They had their own contract, and I had mine. And so you only worked with them on the pilot project, correct? Correct. And for Arrive Can, you were the main vendor, correct? That's correct. I'm confused. In the Dalian and uh, Karatex testimony the other day, Dalian and Karatex were asked, do you work with GC Strategies? And they said, on occasion. I specifically remember them saying that. On occasion to me means more than once. Otherwise you would say, no, only the one time. So that's a little confusing to me. Could it have been a misstep in terms of what they said and they misspoke? Possibly, but again, on occasion usually means more than once. So that's an interesting response from Mr. Firth. Before we get going, Casper H for the $20 Super Chat. Keep up the work. Uh, good work, you too, and thank you. You're quite welcome. Thank you very much for the donation. Uh, Big Butts, uh, $5 Super Chat. Sorry, that's huge ass. I'm sorry, but I'm not convinced. Even when the liberals are giving him softball questions, he still looks really guilty. Yes, he certainly does. Peter H, $20 Super Chat. You guys are awesome. Keep up the good work. Thank you very much. And that's Peter H's first Super on the live stream. Thank you very much. Barb Taylor with a $10 Super Chat. Thank you. And that's... Uh, uh, your third Super on live stream. Thank you very much. So, anyway, it might be nothing, but my ears perked up when he said that. What about this subcontractor? Sorry, I don't understand. I was the prime contract, and we had five or six other subcontractors working below us, each delivering different parts for a live cam. Are you aware whether or not your subcontractors had themselves hired subcontractors? I was aware that they did not hire subcontractors. They, my subs did the work. How would you know? Okay. That's the whole problem here, Christian. Commence? How would you know? Very well. And in general and beyond Arrive Can, how do you certify that the information that you send to the federal government on your subcontractors 
is current and factual? This involves um, interactions back and forth with the, with, so if we're using the subcontractor as a term as, as an individual, then there's multiple back and forth validating and ensuring the information is accurate. Alors, comment est-ce que vous expliquez que les curieux... And how can you explain that CVs on... CVs for Mr. Morf and Ms. Dot had overestimated their years of experience? Yeah. Sorry, as I mentioned, that was a mistake. The wrong draft was sent through. There are multiple drafts moving back and, back and forth between the, the ones. There's about three or four versions at any one time. And again, I own it. I, I sent in the wrong, unintentionally, I sent in the wrong version. Okay, come on. How is there a wrong version? Come on. That's garbage. Okay, here, here's the WTF. Like, come on. Come the F on. I'm sorry, but when I'm dealing with a new organization, like any of you, and you're sending in a resume for a job application to be considered... I send one version, and which version is that? The it's only the most, version? It's the most up-to-date version with my recent experience. Three ver... What is wrong with you? This guy thinks we're all stupid, or he thinks the committee's stupid. That's the problem. Like, this guy... His lies aren't even any good. Like, did he go to the school of Dr. Evil to learn how to lie here? Because it's <laughs> it's just terrible. It's 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 not even funny. It's just terrible. They're so transparent. Oh, only th th three versions. I, I own that. What? So you are you are now saying or trying to imply that the two Botler people accidentally decided to rewrite their resumes with an obscene amount of extra experience just because? Are you seriously suggesting that? Clearly, this guy need, needs the same PR coach that the, the Dalian and the Cordex guy had when they were speaking. This guy has nothing. Before we continue, I want to say thank you to David Edwards with a $5 super chat. In plain English, he worked with them because he saw a naive company that he could use to scam our money. Um, I think I get the feeling that the folks at Butler were just very kind-hearted, trusting people. And I think that Christian Firth took advantage of that. Well, and remember, the app that they were making was supposed to do a lot of good, right? The, the app that they were making was supposed to inform people and help them respond to possible sexual harassment. That's what it was supposed to do. So, you know, this is a project, no doubt, born of passion. Uh, if you if you recall the testimony from uh, Ritika Dutch, she was saying that this came from, you know, her own personal experience. So she was very invested in it personally. No doubt um, uh, Mr. Morv was as well. So, you know, and, and people with good hearts, unfortunately, end up, assuming that everybody else is is on the level and, and is, is, is going to be forthright. And unfortunately, it's just not the case sometimes. And we also have a $279 super chat from Ryan Peplinski. Thank you. I would ask to see how he labeled file names. Yeah. 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 <laughs> version <laughs> one, version doctored. <laughs> C'est possible qu'il y ait de mauvaises versions d'un curieux. I don't understand how you could have how you could have a wrong version of a CV. <laughs> I feel like I wouldn't make a mistake on my own CV on my years of experience. So how could there have been three or four wrong versions? I don't understand. Can you explain that, please? Oh, we're on the same page. So once we were oh, so oh, get before him. I was in sales, I was a recruiter, and what you typically do is you'd be you'd get the the resume submitted by the resource. There is no grid or evaluation matrix that matches 100% to, to the resume you have in front of you. There might be missing some information on technology uh, and, and other bits and pieces. So what there is, is there, there's a second version that's created that would have all the details and information in there, which would be compliant. At that point, there's conversations back and forth 
good at uh, understanding what is accurate and what is not, uh, what can be claimed and what cannot be. Uh, is this technology in this resume or is it not? Merci. It's, it's, a, it's a working document back and forth. OK. Um, <laughs> She doesn't accept that. C -C -C -C. None of us do. OK, perfect. Thank you. OK, so the one thing I will say, again, we try and be as objective and factual as possible. But one thing I have seen is that sometimes you will receive a resume from a staffing agency and it is in their template. It has their logo on it. It has their letterhead on it. It is being purported as almost it's their employee. So that's the only time I've seen, call it a second version of a resume, but all they are supposed to do is lift and transpose what is in the employee's original resume and put it into their template and that's it. Because anything over and above that, you know, if they're adding things to the resume that the employee doesn't have, that's called fraud. And you can't do that. So that's the only time I have seen that. What he's talking about? No, sorry. Thank you to Jerry Savoy for a $2 super chat. Never have three resumes in my life, right? And for Arrive Can, you supervised the work how many years were charged for the front end of arrive can because we already know the answer um we, we don't sorry so first of all we don't supervise the work we we're not you know as a prime contractor or prime vendor, you're responsible for project manage uh, for not nothing to do with project manager or, or nothing to do with budget management. So I don't have the exact number, but if you were to take 23 resources who are working on the project and you know times that by two years, that would give you the days or hours that was put towards. So I think um, I remember in somebody's testimony, there was 8,200 days. If you were to divide that by just 16 resources, not the 23, that still returns less than two years worth of work per resource. Which is still ridiculous, everybody. Which is still bloody ridiculous. What you're talking about is it's an app that has effectively a form, a submission form. It has a facial recognition piece and a data link between the app and the government systems in the back end. And then in the back end, it's data processing, search indexing, that type of thing. And then it returns a result based on some calculations. Poorly done calculations, but calculations. So that's not two years worth of work. And they're just talking the front end. Never mind the back end stuff, everybody. They're just talking the design of this form. Two years to do that, all of you should be fired and the people that worked on it should never be allowed anywhere near technology ever again. Moins de deux ans de travail par année par ressource, mais au total, quelque chose... So in, so in total, that's two years of work for the front end. So the interpreter regrets, but she can't hear. Maybe those same developers Sorry, developed the interpreter was, software. Can you hear me better now? Yep. So no, my it wasn't just the front end. There was <laughs> there was accessibility. There was back end integration. There was object character recognition. front end. And there was also back into the legacy systems. For that, we had twenty three resources at one time billing that could have been for twenty for two years. So if you did twenty three or even twenty to twenty three resources for an approximation for two years worth of work, that would be the number that would have been presented for the uh, what was invoiced for doing that work. Which is highway robbery. Pour vous. It's our time, uh, Merci. Ms. Vanola. Mr. Johns for six minutes, please. Frith. Um, Frith, he's still calling him Frith. To, uh, oh my the goodness. golden mail story that cited that 
Cordex had submitted forms to the agency about their the, the Butler work experience without their knowledge or permission. Now, it cites that Ms. Dutt said a two-month summer internship at Deloitte on her resume was inflated in, in an invoicing point form to say she had 51 months of experience working for the accounting firm. Sorry, let me just pause for a moment. I'll pause your time. Apparently, we're having translation issues. Can I want to start again if I could? Pour pouvoir entendre. Well, while they're starting out their translation issues, uh, I'm going to read a few super chats. We have scoops with a first ever super chat on a live stream, six dollars ninety nine cents. Truth, truth be told, I've sent the wrong resume to an employer once. Yes, but I'm sure that you didn't go from, you know, one month of experience to one hundred months of experience. That's the factor of difference that we're talking about here, scoops. We also have Sean with a 699 super chat. I have three resumes, one professional, one for self-employed, but I've never had to use for the porn star stunt double one. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and we've also got Justin with a $2 super chat. Love you guys. Thank you for your work. Thank you, everybody. In order to hear the interpreter, I need to put my volume really high and so as soon as the interpreters change i'm going to have a bit of a loud blast in my ear so i'd rather if the the issue could be solved with us two moments like the real-time translation is something very you know remarkable that the interpreters are able to do that but like this technology can we test if uh, the french difficult. is going through now properly yeah okay merci Huge ass with a two dollar super chat. I mean, who hasn't lied on a resume now and then? Well, Mr. I've Jones, never done that. Start again. You're at twenty seconds. I'm too afraid to get caught. <laughs> Mr. Frit, Cordex Mr. had Frit. submitted forms to the agency about do, uh, the Butler work experience, and they cited that Ms. Dot said a, a two month summer internship at Deloitte was on her resume, and it was inflated in an invoice points form uh, to say she had fifty one months of experience working for the accounting firm. Did you make those changes? Oh, oh. Sorry, just one quick question. Invoice points form, what does that mean, sorry? Did, I'll just get to, to the point. Did, did Dotler give you their, their CV? Yes, they did. Their CV, they said they only sent it to you once, is, is my understanding. Is that true? That's correct. So did you inflate it uh, from a two-month summer internship that they worked at Deloitte to 51 months? This, is, this was one of the versions that we had talked about that you go back and forth with the resources to validate. No, 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 no. What? You, no, no. You said they sent it to you once. If they sent it to you once, it was never sent back to them, and then they sent it to you again. That's once. No, no, what he's trying to argue, which is a complete load, but what he's trying to argue is that, oh, they sent it to me, and then we went back and forth, and I made the changes, is what he's trying to say. But, like, that's just garbage. Here, here how about this? Uh, prove it. Prove that happened. Mr. Frith? I'm going to start calling him Mr. Frith now because he doesn't deserve to be called Mr. Frith. Well, it's, it, no, it's annoying. <laughs> this is not going to the wrong version. There no. was my mistake. No, who, did you, go, who did you go back? Over. I'm asking you a question. You're under oath. Who did you go back and forth with? We didn't, I didn't go back and forth with the resources. There was not time to do so. There was pressure <gasps> from CBSA to get the resumes from Coradix, which followed down to me. And in turn, I made a mistake and sent the wrong resumes. What? Okay. What? So he's admitting to identity theft right there. Or fraud or both. Both. Because he said they, they went back and forth. Okay, so you just said you didn't go back and forth with the resources. Who did you go back and forth with? Oh, wait a minute. That would be Dalian. Which I believe. Or Karatex or whatever it's called. Because Dalian was the prime on this contract. Remember, everybody? That's what they kept saying. And the thing is, is the government recognizes years of experience when they're dealing with contractors that inflates the value of the contract. So if Dalian and GC Strategies were talking about the resumes and Dalian said, no, 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 they need more experience in order to get this payment level, then Firth would say, okay, so well, well, how much experience do I need to put on the resume? 51 months. Okay, I'll put 51 months. Does that work? Sure, that works. <laughs> These guys never expected to get caught. Guaranteed they didn't. 
You don't do illegal stuff like this and expect to get caught. And I bet that these guys were doing it long before this because oh, they are way, way too confident. 100%. Before we continue, we want to say thank you to David Edwards for a $5 super chat. 40 hours a week for one year is 1,500 hours times two equals 3,000 times 23 equals 69,000 man hours for an app that didn't even effing work. Correct. That's insane. Clearly, David, you should be doing uh, more math uh, for these guys than, than they can because they can't even figure that out. But was it 20, 23 years or was it twenty was it 32 years? It was many years. It was a long time. Too a many long years. time that did not happen. The, 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 the number is too many years. Butler supplied you with a resume. It was changed. Who changed it? I made the I made the edits. But again, the wrong so, so, version was sent so through. Mr. Frith, the government received forge work experience for Ritika Dutt and Amir Moore of, of Butler. Hundreds of thousands of dollars were awarded based on fraudulent points invoicing. That's incredibly serious. On, tu on Tuesday, Colin Woods told us that he simply submitted the documents that GC Strategies provided to Dalian. If that's true, then you're responsible for fraud. I want to give you a it chance to respond to that. <laughs> yeah, because you just admitted it in committee that you made the changes. Daphne Devine, member for five months. Thank you so much, Daphne. Uh, nope, at Fox, but I think getting caught today is going to open up Pandora's box of government contracts with Mr. Filth. <laughs> oh, I mean, Mr. Firth. Well played, Daphne. That's what we need to call him, Mr. Filth. Mr. Filth. There you go. Thank you, Daphne. We will be calling him Mr. Filth from now on. <laughs> uh, wow. This should be quite the response, everybody. Oh, no, no, that's not what I meant. You're calling it fraud. There was a genuine mistake that was not made with intent. So you're telling me you fraud. changed a resume with someone's experience for two months to 51 months and, and, and it's not fraud and also that this doesn't give you a better chance to get other contracts from the government of Canada in the future? I, I, I bet you your, your, your competitors would have a different view of that. We, this was a, a, a solitary mistake made once that, was, that I'm owning up to. This is not something I do frequently to gain business and get a competitive edge. This was a well, that, mistake that in I the game of, it was the, it was the, the wrong version was sent through. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, when the NDP is getting mad at you, you know you're you're in a bad space. But the lie detector determined that was a lie. As I said, I bet these guys have been doing it for a very, very long time. And they've been getting away with it up until now. I'm owning up to it now. I didn't own up to it before then. But I'm owning up to it now yeah. because I'm having to on committee. Yeah. Wow. Have you done any work with Deloitte as a sub or a ghost contractor? I don't think so. I don't. What about Price Waterhouse Cooper? I think I I don't have this information in front of me. This you're asking clients that I've had for the last eight years that I don't have. This is interesting. Um. And I'll tell you why it's interesting after I read that Lindsay Well with a $5 super chat. I first heard of you both on Clyde's podcast. You have quickly become my favorite channel. Thank you for all you do. I look forward to all your videos. Oh, thank you very thank much. Thank you. And thank you for your first super. So it's interesting, this line of questioning. And I'm curious to see where it goes. Because he asked, um, the NDP guy asked if he has contracts with Deloitte. And I thought, okay, well, that's because... Deloitte was on uh, Ratika's Dutt's uh, resume. And then he asked, have you done business with Price Waterhouse Cooper? So Price Waterhouse Cooper and Deloitte are consulting firms. What they also do is audit. That's interesting to me. So they will actually be contracted by organizations to go in and do forensic audits. They'll do um, organizational audits. They'll do all kinds of audits, IT audits. You name it, they audit it. So it's interesting that this is the line of question that he's taking. Uh, Space Dave 2000 with a $2 super chat. This guy could be a liberal leader prime minister. He sure could. He's definitely qualified by the amount he lies. And also, if you recall from our deep dive that we did, John Oskowski, Os Oswowski. Oswowski bit is now the managing director at PricewaterhouseCooper in Ottawa. He sure is. So... I wonder if these two are doing the exact same thing over at PwC. Because apparently, 
John and Firth, well, they've at least met once. We'll see. But you wouldn't no even know if you had a was... contracts with someone like a, 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 an organization like Pricewaterhouse Coopers. You wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to recall that. That's a big contract. If We've had don't. hundreds of task authorizations. I, I'm sorry, I, I can get back to you in writing with any question you pose with risk for subcontracts. I can get back to you. I just don't have that information in did, front did of me. Did you get paid I've... on on the bot uh, for the Bottler contract and the Dalian Cortex? Is it three hundred fifty thousand dollars? No, nope. did, there did was GC strategies was three, get that? I, I received zero payment at all How for much any GC... work done with Butler. So you never got any, any funding from uh, Dalian or Cortex? Correct. So you, you just wrote a check to Butler for $112,000 out, out of the goodwill of GC strategies? The federal government paid their prime, which was Dalian Coradix. They in turn, because we had, a, we had a, a, a contract between the two of us, I then paid the full amount owing to Butler straight away. So you paid it from GC Strategies? Correct. And you billed out Dalian and Cordex? No, I invoiced. No, I did. There was, it was a 0% pass-through. No money was made at all. Whatever CBSA paid Dalian, whatever Dalian paid me, I paid uh, uh, Butler. And they so, cashed both checks. So you got paid, <laughs> they, they and then you payment. paid them. I'm trying to get to the bottom of this. I'm trying to understand this. You got paid from Dalian, and then you paid them? Yes, with so zero got, margin okay, and zero money okay, made. Okay. Um, in terms of the uh, the the, the set aside, um, is it's my understanding that you did this uh, that Bottler was doing some work, um, and on, on the set aside, it, can you explain that? You know what we've heard at testimony already. Yep. So once the um, presentation was approved by the president, at that point, CBSA. They will go back and they'll look at existing uh, contracts they currently have and what would fit better in a statement of work that has been on a competitive contract that's in, in existence. They chose okay. Dalian and Karadix's contract. Okay. You, you said you would let it slide in an email about a payment and you would recover it later um, because you're certain you'll get more government contracts and that you were basically going to take payment for this deal off of another deal. Would that be accurate? No, that's... The no, that's your interpretation. Okay, what's In your sales, interpretation you of that email? That'd be good to explain that. <laughs> yeah, let's yeah. see it. You win some, you lose some. Up to that point of representing them for 12 months, I've made $0. I got the pilot. I didn't get any money off of this one. In sales, you win some. Sometimes you lose some. I was looking out to the next one, not to recover money, but my understanding was I thought we had something. And again, I continue to work with them even after I got $0 to try and get new meetings to understand that I can make, I will get money eventually on one of these contracts. Okay, BS. So, um, well, as far as I understand, what he's talking about is fraudulent billing, right? Um, it could be interpreted as that. Yeah. It could be interpreted as that. If he if he artificially inflated the contract, um, but even that, um, like when you take payment from one contract to another, that's fraudulent billing or that's contract fraud. Well, so fraudulent billing is when you are billing for work that you didn't do. So that's fraudulent billing. Um, that's most commonly heard of in the public eye when it comes to law firms, um, where you're just invoiced from, from a lawyer and you have no idea what billable hours they actually worked on. So you just assume it's true and then you pay it. Um, but some law firms have actually gotten caught for overbilling by substantial amounts where they're saying lawyers are doing extra work and they're actually not and they're charging their clients money for it. So that's, that's fraudulent billing. Um, contract fraud is when you are paid to do a contract um, and you artificially inflate that and that money is allocated for a completely different contract. To Either way, else. though, they're both white collar crimes, are they not? They're, they're both crimes. Yeah. They're both crimes. Um, but what he was saying, um, so I've known sleazy sales guys and what he, what sounds like he was trying to do, and this was in the Globe and Mail story, you can you can look at it in, in one of our other videos. What it sounds like he was trying to do is gain some leverage over the Bottler people to be beholden to him. And I don't believe he didn't take any money. I think he still took money because he charged an extra 20% that raised the contract up to $420,000. According to Bottler, it was three fifty, dollars But Dalian wanted their cut. So in, in one of our videos, we suspected that, you know, when they came back and said, oh, well, you're only going to get 337 and we're not going to take any. We surmised, 
before the Butler testimony happened that uh, that was complete garbage and that GC Strategies was going to take that that extra $13,000 and keep it. And then the Butler, uh, the Butler testimony confirmed that. So I don't believe that this guy didn't take any money. Show me the bank records and then I'll believe you. Oh, it's probably in an offshore account somewhere. Did you first start doing uh, contracts and, and our, business with the government? Sorry, of I'm afraid that's our time. You'll have to take it up next round. Colleagues, before we continue, I have to suspend for a very brief moment because we have Mr. Antony's uh, finally joining us. We need to just suspend for a uh, time check or a voice check. Chair. chair uh, okay, where's, let me just do the voice check, okay? Mr. Anthony, hello. How are you this afternoon? Oh, I hate it when they do that. Put on the white noise audio. I'm not sure what's better or worse, that or this creepy elevator music. I want to say thank you to Dale Taylor with a 699 super chat. So he's guilty as hell. He will bring down senior liberals for their shell company payments. This will bring out top end corruption. Yep, possibly. Very possibly. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so I assume the person that they have in person is Darren Anthony, which is Christian Lord, First Chair. Partner. Um, the, the committee summoned Mr. Anthony to be here. He didn't have his Zoom updated. He's 45 minutes late. Uh, we want to hear from him for two hours. I suggest the committee just uh, invite him to go on his way today, and then we have him back for another time when he can be here for the full two hours. We summoned him to be here for two hours. We welcome him to come back uh, next week for two hours. It's just the audio is really low. That's unanimous, Chair. We don't have any control over the audio uh, uh, feed. The will of the committee is going to have is to have you come back at another time for two hours. Uh, you're excused. You can That's funny. That's funny. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming out. Get out. <laughs> hey, the liberals have done it. <laughs> Thanks for coming out. Get the hell out. <laughs> you can't show up on time. Get out. I will not be asking any questions or inviting any comment from you. Wow. Brock, you are up for six minutes, please. Come on, adjust the audio, guys. Mr. Firth, um, there's a few things I want to remind you about uh, before I ask you some questions. Yes. With respect to parliamentary privilege, which every member enjoys oh, oh, oh. in this committee, it's a, it's, it's a contempt of parliament, sir, to mislead this committee by giving a false statement or false evidence to refuse, unless related to cabinet confidence, to answer any questions or to fail to produce documents that this committee might require someone to produce. So although you are not sworn on a holy book, this parliamentary privilege binds your conscience and binds your responses to always provide us with the truth. Do you understand that, sir? Mr. Firth, do you understand that? Yes, I did. Oh. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry, but Mr. First just turned into a 12-year-old boy <laughs> in front of Mr. Brock. He transformed into a 12-year-old boy with that response. Brock that, has that effect on people, especially that, guilty people. Oh, that was such a meek response. Oh, my goodness. Uh, scoops of another 279 Super Chat. The way questions are going, that dude got a break. Yes, he did. Um, and it didn't sound like Darren Anthony was uh, happy to actually <laughs> leave. I think he started to say something, and then Kelly said, uh, that didn't require a response from you. <laughs> Get out. Um, oh, man. Oh. Larry Brock, man. Larry Brock. If I go to war, I want him beside me. And Mr. Firth, um, in light of all of the criminal uh, allegations that have been levied against you and Dalian and Coradex over the last uh, several weeks. Specifically, the following offenses have been in the spotlight. The offense of theft over 5,000, forgery, fraud over 5,000, impersonation, all of which, if prosecuted by indictment by a prosecutor in this country, could result upon conviction of someone serving a sentence greater than two years. You aware of that, sir? <laughs> yes, I am. And under this cloud of 
serious and significant criminal suspicion. Have you retained legal counsel? Yes, I have. Good idea. And has legal counsel, without me asking what legal counsel has informed you, has legal counsel impressed upon you the importance of telling the truth? Yes, they have. Has legal counsel instructed you not to answer certain questions? No, they have not. Thank you. Bad legal counsel. One area that uh, you have been presented with, sir, that gives me <coughs> a great discomfort as a parliamentarian is the issue regarding resumes. And quite frankly, sir, whether you call it a mistake, whether you call it a lack of intent, whether you refer to it as an embellishment, in my respectful submission, sir, that is a lie. And no one believes you. No one believes you in this room. We have national reporters in this room, and I doubt very much that they believe you, because your story is so fantastic. It's simply worthy of unbelief. Ladies and gentlemen, he's he's not really even asked him a proper question yet. This is the lead up. No, it's just chiding him. It's amazing. This is the get ready, buddy, because I haven't asked you a question. And the hammer's coming. Before we wow. continue, we have a few super chats. Thank you, Nilok, for the two dollar super chat. You guys rock. Thank you for covering this. You know, I bet I bet he got his legal advice this way. He probably contracted a company to get him some legal advice, and they said, sure, we'll get you some legal advice. And then they subcontracted that out to another company called GC Strategies, and they said, oh, we can probably get you some uh, some legal advice. And then uh, they subcontracted it out. Yeah, and then they <laughs> subcontracted it down, and they ended up with some you know failed-out law student that is actually the nephew or, or brother or or some sort of relation of Justin Trudeau and the Trudeau Foundation. That's probably what happened in the lawyer he got, his quote-unquote legal advice. Um, and this no one believes you uh, thing um, reminds me of when he went after Morris Rosenberg. And we did a short on that because Rosenberg was telling him something and he interrupted and said, nobody believes you. Nobody believes you, sir. Anyway, go ahead, Fox. Thank you to Sean with the 699 Super Chat. Let's no longer rock on. It's officially changed to Brock on. Very nice. And Space Dave 2000 with a $5 super chat. If you were smart, he'd take amnesty and take the liberals down. Avoid jail and being the fall guy. Yeah, but my guess is if he tried to take amnesty, they'd make him pay back the money. So he's probably trying to take like the snake's way out, you know? And also, thank you to David Edwards for $2 Super Chat. Time to go to chalet country. Okay, you guys keep giving us spoilers, and now I'm very curious. Here we go. <laughs> Here we go. I think we, I think we need to change to this now. <laughs> you, sir, at all material times only received one version of the CV from both Ritika Dutt and Mr. Amir Moravej. One CV, one resume that was not ambiguous, that was not confusing, and you took it upon yourself to manipulate both of those resumes to ensure that Bottler qualified for government funding. You did that without the express permission or consent of both Bottler's executives, and in so doing, sir, you have committed a serious criminal offense. Now, here's the problem for Mr. Filth. So, Mr. Filth, in order to defend that, okay, he would have to say, yes, I had consent to do that, and I have proof of that. I have that in an email that can be audited. That is the only defense that this gentleman would actually have. The problem is, is we're assuming that the whistleblowers from Butler are telling the truth and we have no reason to believe that they're not. There was no such email and there was no such consent. So this is a huge problem for Mr. Filth. 
And I don't know how he's going to try... Well, he's going to try to defend this badly. But there's no rational way he can defend this. He's going to say, well, you know, we, it was verbal. Prove it. Prove it. Do you have anything to say about that? Or are you going to continue on this line that I made a mistake? Yeah. I'm going to tell the truth. And it was a genuine mistake because there are multiple versions of the resume. They may have given me one, but as a recruiter, you make ver different versions of resumes. And the wrong one was sent Sir, through. Sir, who made multiple versions? You or somebody else? I did. I started my, I started my career as a recruiter. So I'm on it's, earth, it's just sir, a way of sir, sir, why on earth would compel you to modify one one version of the resume received by both individuals? Why did you have to modify it and create different versions <laughs> without their consent now. or permission? Why? Because accompanying every resume going to the federal government is a matrix, an evaluation matrix. There, that is a score you that go. you get to be compliant, to be a certain category there you go. on the contract. This is the justification, everybody. He said the quiet part out loud. This is, what, this is what we said. Okay? This is what we said. So there is a scoring system that the government uses in order to evaluate talent doing work for them. And it scores you extra points, which bumps up the compensation and the value of the contract. Okay? This is what he's talking about. I just didn't think he would actually say it out loud. Clearly, the lawyer should have instructed him not to answer certain questions. Lied to ensure that they qualified. You embellished. I, I'm afraid you that manipulated is, the gentlemen, facts. I'm afraid that is our time. You can continue on the next round. Ms. Fatwin, please, for five minutes. <laughs> oh, he's lucky. Safe by the bell. Mr. Chair, and thank you to our witnesses for being with us today. Um, so I, I had a bit of lines of questions here, but your opening statement led me to want to ask a few different things. Um, specifically, you mentioned that Butler did not complete uh, the work up to CBSA standards as far as the final deliverables and that it was rejected. Um, we have not heard this from the CBSA that I'm, that I'm aware of. Um, oh. So how do you know this information? So they would have relayed the information to Dalian and Karadix, who would have then told me. Okay. And so according to the Global Mail, GC Strategies is listed as a subcontracting, on a subcontracting document as a subcontractor to Dalian. Is that correct? You were a subcontractor to Dalian? That's correct. So... Can you explain how Dalian and critics can subtract to a non-Indigenous entity if they were given an, an Indigenous contract uh, through a set-aside? Um, sorry, but my, my understanding for an Aboriginal set-aside, I'm not an Aboriginal set-aside company, but for a contract, I think it's, after listening to Mr. Wood's testimony, it's to encourage um, Aboriginal entrepreneurs to then build companies. And I, I don't think, I'm, I'm, I don't think you need to be Aboriginal to be on an Aboriginal contract. Okay, <laughs> so I find it not surprising, but also amazing that he also just admitted that he watched the testimony of Dalian Karadix. Of course he should. Why are you admitting it? I wonder if he watched our version of it. Uh, probably not. <laughs> um, but it makes me wonder, because I think most of you on the stream probably watched that. It makes me wonder if when... Mr. Wood had stated, oh, well, we actually didn't change the resumes. Uh, that would have come from GC Strategies. Was Mr. Phil sitting there saying, shit. <laughs> I wonder if that was his reaction. <laughs> I wonder if that was his reaction watching that testimony because he was just like, oh, crap. I'm screwed. I wonder if that was actually his reaction. Um but, okay, your business is built solely around subcontracting from the government. And one of the government rules is to subcontract 5% of its total procurement to Indigenous businesses. You are not going to make yourself aware of the rules and regulations surrounding that so you don't violate it. That's a big mistake, considering that you do virtually all of your business with the government. 
<laughs> As some people on the internet say, you need to do your own research and you need to educate yourself. Okay. Do you Again, I'm, have... I'm, not, I'm not an expert. But I'm not on the Aboriginal set aside. Do you currently have any contracts with CBSA that are active? I have one that's active, but there's no resources on there. Okay. Um, so can you please describe your relationship with uh, Cameron McDonald, who's former director general of the CBSA? Yes, please describe that. Um, when I first started as a junior sales in 2009, we were encouraged by our VPs to, to use GEDS, which is the government electronic uh, directory, to make cold calls and get meetings and try and identify opportunities within organizations. Mr. McDonald picked up the phone in 2009, and I've been having meetings from then until the present day. Okay, so when did when did work begin? So when was this kind of yep. contractual? So, so meeting in 2009, 11 years later, I had my first contract with uh, from Mr. Cameron McDonald. Okay, and who approached whom to engage Bottler in selling its software to the federal government? Uh, so nobody approached me about Bottler. There was uh, conversations had by the CBSA, understanding that uh, more recently there's been accusations made in the Vancouver Sun and other media outlets around uh, harassment and some things in the public safety. So at that point, it was there's got to be some sort of product out there for some small Canadian firm that we can try and identify some opportunities. At that point, I researched firms that were out there, and Bottler was Canadian, and they were from Montreal, so they could get... Should there be a government contract eventually, it'd be easy for them to get government security clearances. And then that's when I reached out to them. But you reached out to the Bottler people saying that you already had a contact and a client. And then the Bottler firm realized later that that client was Mr. Cameron McDonald. So that's backwards of what you told the Bottler crew. So either you were lying to Bottler or you were lying to CBSA? Or you were lying to everybody? Why not both? Okay. Um, you've also mentioned that your, your commission rate was between 15 to 30%. Is, is it standard to have a variable commission rate like that? It depends because a lot of the, the commission you get is off of a per diem. So if I had a per diem for $1,000 and there were two resources, one requested 850 and one requested 750. That would be the range in difference from sometimes. So again, it's always the difference between the pay rate and the bill rate is what determines your, it's not a flat fee. Okay, and what would be your, your hourly rate? For what, sorry? Just on a general contract, what would be your, your average hourly rate? Um, I'm usually working in per diems, not hours, so. I'm guessing somewhere around 150 $110 an hour, but somewhere between a, between 90 and 120 Okay. That's low. Um, and just back to the this this subcontractual relationship with, with Cordex and, and Dalian. Um, was this arrangement negotiated with them directly, um, or was it with the federal government, or with, was it with both? So once the, I guess, uh, the, the pilot was approved, CBSA reached out to... Um, Dalian and Karadix and said, we're going to use your vehicle. And in turn, they reached out to me and said, you're going to be working with Dalian and Karadix. We deem this to be the most suitable contract. And then at that point, Dalian and Karadix and myself had a conversation. And these quote unquote contracts, everybody, is all for the government to circumvent competition. Okay. That's the, that's the thing that I find just most most concerning about this. The window dressing for the public is actually GC strategies. Um, and I guarantee you that the government is hoping that this is where the attention stays. This guy is, is a thief. This guy is a swindler. I'll say most likely, most likely he's those things. It remains to be proven in a court of law, but most likely based on everything that we're hearing, that's what he sounds like. I guarantee you, this is just the window dressing. There's more going on behind the scenes with this. Much, much, much more. So just keep that in mind as you're listening to all of this. This can't happen in isolation. 
this can't happen just with one guy outside of the government making this happen. It can't happen. There have to be people inside. And he's he's bragged about it to Butler. Well, he said he had dirt on pe- people. Was it the was it Woods and Yale that he had uh, had dirt on? Like he, they operate as like a network. Right. So there's there's lots of moving pieces in here, and he's even bragged that you know he has access to many of the deputy ministers and assistant deputy deputy ministers. That's the DMs and the ADMs. Those are the appointed positions within the agencies by the government. Yeah, so those are the leaders of the different uh, government agencies. agencies. So yeah. like CBSA, for example. Yeah, like Erin uh, Aaron Og- Ogerman, she was appointed by the government via Privy Council. So, and welcome aboard Austin Gauthier as an NP supporter. Thank you very much. But until that, until that point, we had no idea which contract would be used until CBSA told us. Okay, and you know, have you ever had any you know allegations of this nature um, made against you or a company you were associated with before? Never, never. Um, and just you also mentioned um, your concerns with um, our, our previous witnesses feeding the media. Um, can you elaborate on this? Like, what specific information do you, do you take issue with? Well, um, <laughs> pretty much the majority of all of it. Um, they were paid. I'm not happy that they actually recorded things and protected themselves. I'm not happy about that because it reduces the capability for me to lie. Oh, well, and I hate this line. And he's right in the middle of saying it. Oh, well, you know, they were paid and, you know, they, they weren't paid for the last few because they didn't deliver. They delivered everything that they were supposed to. The only thing that Butler did not deliver was all the dirt that they are currently using against you guys yeah what they didn't deliver was their silent compliance with the corruption that's what they didn't deliver and that would have made them complicit and that was an important decision they made i, I want to emphasize that to everybody if so as Butler became more aware to this and they became aware that actual laws were being broken if they continued on and were silent about this they are now complicit and could be regarded as a co-conspirator. But they didn't. These guys blew this wide open. Wide open. These guys, for, for like they, they gave up their paychecks to expose this for Canadians. Like, this is huge. Yeah, from the sounds of it, they could have been paid in full. Their $336,000, quote-unquote, full, which was supposed to be three fifty, And went on their way. And maybe they could have secured more government contracts via GC strategies and made a bunch of money, like probably some other crooked vendors are. But they chose not to do that. They chose to stand up, have some integrity, and fight for the old school Canada that we all remember. Remember the Canada you used to be proud to grow up in? Remember the Canada where you at least had some trust that people were doing the right thing. It was a long time ago. So it's nice to see that those people are still around. Because it's basically David and Goliath here. They're going up against the government. And good on them. They deserve all of the karma, all of the support, and all of the cheers that they can get. Because... With Canada as broken as it is, we need really good examples of really good people to prop up, to show everybody there's still this type of people in this country. And that is what this country is built on. They're heroes. They really are. Sorry for going off on the rant, yeah. but, you know, I just, we, we cannot say enough about these two. They really, really deserve good things in life. Um, I mean, it, it does bring suspicions to me where I, as this was, as we found out that later on, they were actually feeding the media around the time they decided after not speaking with me for a year to then make me sign a confidentiality agreement, understanding that I couldn't defend myself and put contradictory evidence towards it. Um, you also mentioned that some of your... I'm, your I'm sorry, Ms. Role... Atwood, that is our time. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Ms. Finola for two and a half, please, and Mr. Johns for two and a half. Merci beaucoup. Monsieur Firth, où était votre bureau à 
Thank you very much, Mr. Firth. Where was your office in Ottawa when you had one? We were on Bank Street between Queen and Kent. Sorry, Queen and Albert, I think. Okay. Um, so 151 and a half Bank Street. Merci. Lorsque uh, vous êtes apparu. When you appeared before the committee on October 20th, 2022, you stated that you had charged $9 million for materials and hiring for arrive can if i average that out with the hourly rate that you gave us 90 to 120 the average is 105 9 million divided by 105 by 2 that's about $43,000 $43,000 hours of work rather per year that were billed by GC strategies. And so was that only for your work or for your subcontractors as well? Um, so we, we don't get paid to do the work on them. It was just only going to be the subcontractors. So first of um, the hourly rate that I gave you was on average for across the whole of the federal government. They were a little bit higher for ArriveCan because the specific technologies that were required were, were not normal. Je veux juste rappeler ce que vous avez dit. I just want to come back on what you said in October 2022. You said we weren't given $9 million. We invoiced $9 million for the time, materials, and the commitment. So it's for the two of you at GC Strategies or for all subcontractors? So our invoicing to, for the federal government was to pay all of our subcontractors that was used on ArriveCan. Et vous n'avez rien reçu de ces 9 millions. And you didn't receive any of that 9 million. Yes, we received commission on the 9 million dollars. Combien? How much? How much was that? Ah, uh, he's like, uncomfortable. Like I spoke to the honorable gentleman before, I do not have the exact numbers. All of the information was given to you. You guys can, there's a, all of my invoices to the federal government and all of my invoices to my subcontractors. All of the information has previously yeah. been provided. All right. So previously he has said that his commission goes as high as 30%. So let's shoot for the moon, shouldn't we? Because, you know, it's COVID, government spending money like crazy. Nobody's going to notice, right? So 30%. 30% of 9 million. What's 30% of 9 million, chat? Roughly three. Roughly three. Fox isn't good at mental it's math. 2.7 2. million dollars. 2.7 million dollars for doing absolutely jack. Jack. Okay. 2.7 million. So each of them got $1.35 million apiece. And by the way, these guys have no operating expenses because they work from home. They have no office. So there you go. Optic Brave Wolf with the $2 Super Chat. Dude is the biggest leak for the Liberals by lives. <laughs> Could be. Could be. Thanks, Mr. Firth. Uh, Mr. Johns for two and a half, please. Um, more of... He supplied you with a resume that said he had seven years experience, but you submitted a resume that said he had 12. Is that correct? I don't have the document in front of me, sorry. And she had a, a two month summer internship at Deloitte, like I talked or, or mentioned earlier, and you agreed that you had submitted one that said she had 51 months experience. So that's total of seven years that they had, just over seven years experience. But my understanding, is for the task authorization, they needed 10 years. So you inflated it to meet the task authorization. Is that correct? Again, the wrong version was sent over, and I made apologies for that. That was the wrong version. But Yeah, but if you sent the right version over, then they wouldn't have been eligible, would they? Would right. they? Like, how do you even have a wrong version that, that inflates work experience to that degree? But, again, so... This guy, Mr. Johns, has a very, very simple but very important question, okay? 
if he had sent the original resumes, according to the task authorization, if that is correct, and the task authorization required 10 years of experience, guess what? They wouldn't have gotten the contract. Not that they were given a contract, but they wouldn't have been able to work on the project. So guess what would have happened? Mr. Filth contacts Mr. Wood and Mr. Yao and says, hey, so um, we got this Bottler thing. Um, looks like it's going to come to you guys. And uh, we just need to know what's the task authorization requirements. Oh, okay. Well, here's the requirements. Um, they need 10 years here and 10 years here. Oh, crap. Okay. Um, I got to fix up the resume so it matches that and then send to you and then you can send it over. Okay. Oh, yeah. That sounds good. I guarantee you that's what happened. And if you're going to tell me that Dalian and Cordix didn't know about that, I'm not going to believe you. I'm not going to believe you. And I just want to say thank you to everybody in the chat for 1,000 likes. Excellent. Awesome. Thank you, every uh, thank you everyone, for the uh, for all the work. We didn't know if we would uh, hit that again, but uh, apparently we did. So thank you very much. And David Edwards, the two dollar super chat. We need another go at the We Charity scandal. <laughs> One scandal at a time, David. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think we got two brewing right now. Yeah. But that made it so you were eligible for the task authorization. If it was a finally approved, there's not like there was back and forth. You must have appreciate as well. There's other categories on this contract. So if they were deemed non-compliant or they weren't actually after the back and forth, they would have not made that contract. Uh, sorry, that um, the matrix. There are other 14 or 15 other categories that we could have used for that. Do you do this as a, a standard practice with your business? Not at all. I, I said this is a mistake, and it's a, it, and I own it. But it was a mistake. This before to meet the threshold for a task authorization. No. Oh. Well, I, I hope if anybody's watching and feeling a little uncomfortable right now, um, and they're doing their due diligence and, and maybe reviewing some of the, the resumes that have been formatted in the past, that they're going to come forward to this committee. Um, that's something that I, I think I would like to hear. Can you tell me about who Mr. Vaughn Brennan is to you and what relationship he has with you? Mr. Vaughn Brennan, it's a, he was one of our consultants. We played on assignment uh, in the last three or four years. But outside of that, we're not, we're not friends. It's not professional. It's, it's purely a professional relationship where he is a consultant and we find him work when he needs it. So you, you heard that there's dirt that uh, they, they, that Butler had identified that, that you had dirt on any public officials. Uh, is that true? I can never, ever have I ever said this, let alone have I continuously boast about it. I have no dirt on anybody. <laughs> this is actually an appropriate place to uh, pause him. Um, <laughs> you you sound like you boast about everything the way you were testifying last year he was boasting so yeah i completely believe it uh, the, and why would they make that up yeah it seems like a dumb thing to make up why would they make that up like give me a break okay but you again didn't... these are accusa these are accusations made correct yes Yes, the answer is no. I have no dirt on anybody. Okay. Thanks, Mr. Johns. Uh, Mr. Jenglis, for five minutes, please. Wait a minute. If he has no dirt on anyone, does that mean that everybody who has dirt on him is not going to come after him? <laughs> just saying. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. You know what I heard? I just heard Kelly say Mr. Jenglis is next. Yes. This should be interesting. Amazing. What is it that you do? <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Mr. Firth, you are without a doubt the least believable witness I have ever heard appear before a parliamentary committee. Oh, my wow. God. <laughs> that man wastes zero time. Oh, my God. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Wow. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you, everybody, for saying that this is going to be a treat. Uh, you, were, you were absolutely correct in this. Oh, my God. Like opening salvo. Boom! Shots fired. Shots fired indeed. That wasn't even a warning shot. <laughs> that was a shot straight to the face. Wow. I can't make wait to make that one into a short, everybody. And you know what? Um, in the comments, so what, what it would be great to do is 
Um, think of a line that you've heard from Mr. Brock or Mr. Uh, Genuous or Mr. Barrett or anybody else that you would like to see made into a short and post it in the comments. And uh, Fox and I will pick the top 10, then we'll make a poll on our community page, and then we'll let you vote on it, and then we'll do a short on it. How does that sound? Yeah, so Barney B, if you could please copy and paste that information for us, that'd be awesome. So um, so from here, so for, for the whole the whole stream, I know there's more to come, but uh, um, so I, I'm interested to see what people want to hear as a short. Oh, um, and... Sorry, guys. Before we continue, we want to say thank you to Spiky Mikey thirty three for five dollars super chat. Thank you very much. You referred earlier to something you had said about your relationship with Mr. McDonald. You you said it was an embellishment. Um, would you say you're someone who often engages in embellishment? No. 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 So your your claims about Mr. McDonald uh, were were a rare instance of your embellishments. Is that? Your testimony today? I, yeah, yes. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I want to drill down <laughs> on the on the resume issue. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I agree with Jenny. This is the worst lying witness I've ever seen. Um, I think Christian Firth just realized, oh shit, he's pinned me down. Uh, sure, whatever. Dude, they're not they're not they're they're not coming after you for no reason. They're coming after you because your answers suck. They're terrible. And maybe you should watch Judge Judy more often because as Judge Judy says, if you tell the truth, you don't have to have a good memory. Yeah. I know I know this is sort of stuck in the craw of many members. Um you you sent two false resumes that we know of, and you've admitted to as much. You said it was an accident. Uh, we have no way of knowing how many false resumes you sent. Uh, what we know is that we have two whistleblowers, and we have two instances of, of false resumes. So uh, that's a pretty abysmal record when it comes to submitting accurate resumes. Uh, could I ask you, would you be willing to table for the committee all of the different versions of the resumes uh, for Ms. Dutt and Mr. Moravich that you have. Wonderful. Yes. Okay. Uh, would you be able to table them within 24 hours? Uh, I could 48 hours. I think the committee would agree to 48 hours. Um, this, this alleged sort of accident with the resume, um, I want to understand just like really the anatomy of how these alleged accidents happen. So, um, so, so how does this process unfold of you sort of creating multiple resumes, the, the true ones and the false ones, and trying to remember to submit the true one as opposed to the false ones that you have created for some unknown person? <laughs> Just walk me through how that, how that mistake <laughs> got made, allegedly. You know, what I love about Genuous is he, like, takes things to absurdity. Which he he just like takes the testimony and just makes it so ridiculous and like throws it back in the witness's face. He's so good at it. Yeah, he he, he, he it's it's a it's a premise actually in philosophy. It's called reducto ad absurdum, uh, and it basically means reduced to absurdity. Um, and it's a way of actually flushing out invalid arguments. <laughs> so if you take if you take something and you can reduce it to the absolute most absurd. Um, most absurd scenario of it, it's easy to actually understand what happened or what didn't happen. So he's, you know, commenting on this in such an absurd way because it is absurd. It is fantastical testimony that Christian is trying to pass off on the committee. And pretty sure Christian knows, but this is it. This is all he's got. He knows he's caught. It's all he's got. So he, he has to make this the hill that he dies on. Now, the problem is that he's going to have to walk through the process of something that didn't happen and then claim that it happened as an accident. So there's, there's two versions. You have the one that was sent in by the resource. You then have the one which is compliant against the matrix, which is also the evaluation grid. Compliant. They're the two versions you have. So you have the one, and then there'll be one in between, which is where you've gone back and forth, and you've authenticated that A, the technology is correct, if there was technology that was missing. Because again, not one resume 
ever matches completely with a government matrix. There's always conversations back and forth between a resource and a recruiter or sales to try and identify things they may not have put. Like we have resumes um, with 190 pages worth of experience that we deal with with some of our consultants. We have others. Which okay, let me, let, me, let, let, let me jump in because I, I, th- there's some things you're saying that make sense, and th- but there's some things that don't. So I would understand if you, if you got a resume that, um, that was too long, that contained errors, or that didn't contain important information. You said, hey, we need to get uh, yes, that makes sense. More, dis- more, more background on your educational experience. You, you, you missed identifying specific skills. Uh, so if that's what you mean by fit the matrix, you know, okay, that's maybe a conversation you had with them. What seems to have happened here, though, is that you, you, in order to make it compliant with the specifications of what, what they were asking for, you, you changed some numbers, right? So, so asking someone to, to uh, provide further information is one thing. Um, uh, massively inflating a number associated with a, uh, with a particular field, uh, take, taking a, uh, someone, someone that says they have a bachelor's degree and, and editing that to say a PhD, um, that, that's not just making it sort of systemically compliant. That's making substantive data changes. Uh, so, so, so how did it happen that you made substantive changes to the data on a resume and in this case didn't consult with the resource in either case? How, how did that happen? Yeah, so uh, Genius is, uh, is accurate here. So as many of you probably have, you've applied for a job. But before applying for that job, you look at the job description out there and you say, oh, that's requiring a certain set of skills. On my current resume, there are skills that I do have that match that job description that actually are not on my resume because I don't deem them as important. So you, what you might do is you might add those skills that are missing and you might take off skills that are not relevant. You see this with people sometimes where they have worked in more senior positions, but they're applying for a lower level position. So to try to avoid being categorized as overqualified, they will remove some of the more senior positions that they've actually worked in or skills in order to be a better job fit. And it's still accurate. You're just not including some of the other pertinent information on the resume. So if we were to take Christian Firth at his word, then he would have this matrix and he would be talking to the two the two people from Botler and saying, okay, so we have this matrix and we have to hit, hit say, five of the 10 criteria. Do you have skills that match any of these criteria? Because I don't see them on your resume. And they may say, oh, yes, um, you can put this. I did this at this organization for this amount of time, this at this organization for this amount of time. And then the recruiter would say, okay, great. We're going to add that to your resume and I'm going to send it to you. Let me know if that looks good. Okay, fine. That makes sense because it's true and it's accurate. Not, so we need 51 months of experience and you only have two. Is it okay if I change that to 51, but it's not accurate? Yeah, but we need it for the matrix. And you know, there's $350,000. Like, if you're the, the, the consultant and you're hearing that, you're saying, okay, this probably isn't a good relationship to be in. And I guarantee you that's probably how Butler would have reacted if they knew this was going on. But what they testified is that GC Strategy said, okay, send me your resumes. We need them you know, for the contract. And they said, sure, here you go. And then off they went. And that's the last they heard of it. And then later they found out that their resume has been changed without their permission, submitted to to Dalian without their permission. Dalian submitted them into CBSA without their permission. So this is identity theft and it's resume fraud. I want to say thank you to David Edwards for a $2 super chat. You pair it with Occam's razor. Occam's razor, the simplest explanation tends to be the right one. And if you've seen the movie Contact, you'll know what that is. So again, it, the versions, the second version is making it compliant. You can, after back and forth, you can identify that they would never be compliant, that they don't have that time. At that point, you then go back to the sub and say, what other categories do you have, which are A, level two, that would have seven years or five years? Okay, okay, okay. So you, you enter the false information that would make it compliant. 
and then you send it back to the resource to say, is this true? Is that, is that your process? It's a conversation. You phone them up and you say you go back and forth because phoning is going to be quicker than going back and forth. Right, right, right. Okay, but but your your first step is entering false information that would be compliant with the contract or or at least different information. And then you go back to them and say, can I submit this revised version? Is that your process? You don't. Well, no, you need back and forth because the revised process. Right. Okay. You you, you go back and forth and say, okay, we changed the numbers. Is that okay? And if they say it's okay, you send it. And if they say it's not okay, then you sort of negotiate. I would like to point out one very important thing here. Fox, what's not happening here? He's not denying it? No, that's wrong, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, what are you, <laughs> what are you trying to get at? What happens in virtually every other meeting that the conservatives are constantly interrupting the witness? Oh, there's no uh, points of order and interruptions from the liberals. Zero. Interesting. There are zero interruptions from the liberals in this. There's not very many of them on that committee, though, is there? There's a few. There's a few. Yeah, but they're not really saying anything, are they? And Brock was also not interrupted when he was making his statement. Because they would have said, well, this, this isn't relevant. This isn't relevant. This isn't relevant. There's been zero points of order related to this. Right? Because usually you'll hear, uh, point of order, um, the, the witness needs to be allowed to answer the question, Chair. Zero. Well, I'm guessing that if the liberals appear that they're not on board with this, then that looks really, really bad because it's all this taxpayer money that's wasted. I think the liberals right now are trying to, and I don't want to use the word scapegoat because it sounds like these guys are pretty guilty, but that they're trying to focus all the attention on these CEOs of these ghost companies um, rather than on themselves. Well, and I think they're just trying to stay as quiet as a little mouse in this hearing because this guy is looking shadier and shadier by the minute. If they appear, even appear, to be to be viewed as protecting this guy, that's big problems. And it attracts a lot more attention to the liberals that they don't need right now because they're going to get enough attention down the road by the look of this. So very, very interesting. The silence from the liberals is deafening. But your, your, your initial step is to change the number they put in. Is that correct? It's to make them compliant, and then you start a conversation. And you make them and compliant it, by changing the number in terms of the amount of experience or the amount of time. Is that correct? It's also an exercise for me. No, no, it's not also thing. nothing. And I want you to answer the question. We have to uh, end it right Whoa. there. Mr. Uh, Jouari, please, for five. Whoa. Sorry, I missed that because I was talking to Barnaby. <laughs> no, it's not an exercise. I want you to answer the question. Wow. Genius has no time for BS with this guy. Good stuff. I'm, I'm glad they're all just talking to this guy this way because this guy is party to defrauding the Canadian taxpayer out of millions of dollars. And it's absolutely disgusting. Turn on your mic. Is that Susa? So, no. No, uh, thank God. Resume of two subcontractors came to nice you, and time. you looked at uh, their resume. You compared it into Government of Canada standard template, and you start filling those templates. And then you transfer some of that data over, and then uh, there were some uh, information that were missing. You send it back to the subcontractor, and that's the back and forth that you're talking about, correct? Correct. Okay. So in the process of sending these back and forth and having a conversation with those two consultants on the phone because it's much faster, how many other items on the metrics that you call or the scorecard that you call, how many other points um, were that they needed to be discussed or was missed? So that, again, because of haste, because of pressure from CBSA to Karatex and down to me, the conversation never happened and the wrong version <gasps> was sent. But I can tell... Oh. Nail in the coffin. Nail in the coffin. 
Sorry I'm not talking a lot right now, but I'm just aghast at what this guy's admitting. Yeah, we're both sitting here with our mouths open. Okay. What just happened is he kept going on that there's a back and forth in order to align the resume with the government matrix. And thank you, Mr. Liberal, for actually getting him to admit this. He's saying, okay, so this is, so, so how many, how many times, how, what did you fill in um, through, through, through this back and forth? How many things were added? And then he says, the conversation never happened. Ergo, the conversation with Butler never happened to adjust the resumes. Therefore, he took it upon himself to adjust the resumes and sent it away. Meaning, he committed the fraud. Okay, so that's not an accident. Well, and this lines up with, uh, I believe, it was Ritika Dutt's testimony, who said that they, you know, edited these resumes without our knowledge, without our consent. So Clone 42, we didn't know that already. What we knew is what Butler testified. What they testified to is one thing. What this, this guy was saying, it. what this guy was saying earlier in the in the testimony was that there's back and forth. So he was implying that there's back and forth with Butler on this. What he just admitted to was literally that there was no back and forth. That he did this without their knowledge, without their input. He's he's literally admitting on what's now national television that he committed a crime, criminal offense. Moving on. Before we move on, we have a $2 super chat from Optic Brave Wolf. It says, called it first, just first out the biggest leak. And thank you for your first super on a live stream. There you go. I'll tell you the information included in there could be a small bullet point, which is like gave presentations to senior executives. Like the, these are things that are go in there that are harmless, which is, needs to be qualified. Yeah. So, so the information was transferred into the government standard template in haste uh, the, the 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 resume was sent over no conversation back and forth between uh, your office and the consultants that's understood and just pausing for a 100 dollars super chat from mr norm nicholson thank you so so much norm thank you both for all the effort you expend to bring us the truth Thank you very much for tuning in, and thank you so much for the support, Norm. We really, really appreciate it. Now, um, what is the implication of a change from a two months to a 52 month uh, experience uh, from determining the rate? So what, what does that do? Does it increase the rate? Does it uh, qualify? What, what, what does it do? So from a, this was a fixed price contract. This was not based on per diems. So whether it was this grid for this category or a different category or a different grid or level three or a level two. Yeah, thank you. Still fundamentally, so, the cost so I, the same. I got the answer. So this was a fixed price contract. Can you tell yeah, us so what does a fixed price contract means? It means that it's deliverable based and it's not based on time and material. Okay. So a, a per diem is irrelevant on a fixed price and neither is a category. So that's what usually a fixed price means. So at least the, the change in the number, the years of experience would have had not impact on the dollar value, but it would have an impact on them being qualified to do that job. Is that correct? Correct. The, it, they were, Butler were already predetermined to be the resources working on this. That's fine. Because they're the only yep. two people that know the software and build it. That's fine. So if that's true, then there's no reason to change the resumes. Like you're contradicting yourself with every answer. So it's either they were, they needed to be at that level that inflated the, the rate of the contract or they needed to have the resumes inflated in order to qualify to be resources for it. It's one or the other. You can't say it's neither. Just because Butler was determined to be the company to actually execute the software 
doesn't mean by quote unquote government processes that they're going to be eligible for it based on the requirements that are outlined in the task authorization, which is why you would have needed to elevate these, these resumes accordingly. He probably assumed what the, what these people were or just didn't care because he's done this a million times before. Why not both? And thank you to Scoops for the 279 Super Chat. Uh, GCS, go to jail, do not pass go, do not collect $200. Exactly. Do not collect $2.7 million. Yeah, however much it was. So it was a fixed price. And uh, there seems to be a discrepancy between the 350 as a fixed price or 336 But, uh, you know, um, um, Dalian and Cordex... Uh, charging 14000 on top for whatever, but that's really understood. Um, at least we know the number and we know how to reconcile. Can you talk about the relationship between, um, between you, Dalian, and Cordex as it relates to the um, uh, Butler AI pilot? We are competitors, but we are working together because I'm representing Butler and they have the contract with the, with the client. So although we're competitors, we're professional. So the government would, um, as the prime, would work through Dalian and Karadix, in turn would then work through me for Butler. It would. So government had a relationship with, uh, with Dalian and uh, Cordex, and you had a relationship with Butler. So why, why, in this case, they needed to go through you as an intermediary, although you're claiming that there was zero uh, cost because there was anticipation that in the future businesses, um, you may be, um, they may be, com you may be compensated. So why why would that intermediary need it? Why couldn't uh, uh, you know Cart uh, Dalian and Cordex directly go to Butler uh, rather than having three subcontractor coming under you? And then going to CBC doing the work, and then getting paid by um, by CBSA to Butler to you. <laughs> so th yeah. this is where it is. It is confusing. Um, I mean, understandably, Dalian and Karatix probably had an indication that because I was yeah. working with them for Mr. two Firth, years I, prior. I apologize. I know it's confusing a lot to unpack, but we're out of time for your uh, for the round. Perhaps we can get back to the next time around. Uh, Mr. Barrett, please, for five minutes. Oh, the firing squad's back. Sir, have you been contacted by the RCMP concerning allegations that name your company specifically in the Globe and Mail on October 4th? Because the RCMP is investigating. Have you been contacted? No, I have not. You won't tell the committee what you were paid on ArriveCan for your two-person company that did no IT work on an IT project. But you said your commission was up to 30% of $54 million. So um, you won't tell us how much, but um, that would be up to $16 million. Is that what you're saying? That it could be up to $16 million for a company that does no IT work to do uh, IT work? <laughs> we were never paid $54 million. Our, our piece was the front-end web development and 30, our mobile development. 30%. You said the number was 30%. And so you won't tell us how we, much. So uh, it's up to $16 million. No, it's not. We were not. $54 million included $10 million for a call center. It included other other vendors they used. $54 million was not through GC Strategies contracts. That was so only... You won't, the, tell only us the, how many, you won't tell us how many millions. You're, you're summoned before a parliamentary committee. You won't tell us how many millions you were paid on this. Okay. I just want to point out, Barrett knows damn well. He knows damn well all of the different costs in ArriveCan. I can tell you that 100%. What he's doing is trying to flush out of uh of mr firth the number because firth is saying well I, I i don't have that number but he he gave barrett the percentage so barrett's basically again reducto ad absurdum he's taking it to absurdity fine i'll use the whole number 54 million dollars so you're saying it could be upwards of, of 16 million and then first thing we'll know well how do you know that you don't know the number <laughs> like so it's a pressure tactic that he's trying to use to get Firth to actually say the number to committee. And we want to say thank you to Nilok for a $5 super chat. It says, can you guys make a can't stop the Brock t-shirts or hoodies? 
I think we'd have to get permission from Mr. Brock. Yeah, (laughs) because he's not like a character that we've created, right? He's a real human being. Like, we can't just slap his face on something and and start selling it. But you know who has really nice t-shirts and hoodies is Pierre Polyev, if you go on the conservative website. There you go. But we do know that that you submitted fraudulent resumes that increased the billing and uh, the billing rates and falsely qualified vendors. We know that you lied about your relationship with Cameron McDonald to oversell yourself to subcontractors. That's unbelievable. Have you ever met with government officials outside of government offices, outside of government business hours? No, I have not. You have not. Have you ever met Mark Briard, the former CTO for Canada? Yes, I... Have you ever met him in yeah. a hotel? I, I don't have that information. I can look on my Outlook. I don't think so. You, you don't know if you met him in a hotel. <laughs> do you, Barrett do knows. you know? Of course he knows. If Cameron McDonald has a cottage. I smell Swiss chalet, I think. <laughs> I, I think I smell Swiss chalet. I'm about to be served a quarter chicken dinner, aren't I, guys? Okay. Let me get let me get my fork and knife. I'm ready. I don't know if Cameron McDonald's has a cottage. Do you know if he had one? Okay. I do not know if he had a cottage. How many projects have you worked on with him? Since two, so when we first met in 2009, the first contract I had was in 2020, 11 years after we first had our first call. Can you table all the documentation that you have for projects that you've done with Mr. McDonald? Uh-oh. Yes. That's not going to look good for Mr. Cameron McDonald. Well, on the surface, it's fine. But that's not going to paint a good picture for Cameron McDonald, considering how shady this guy is. When were you approached by Mr. McDonald about Butler? This was a conversation not about Butler, but again, identifying a systemic problem in the federal okay. government with harassment what was the price for the CBSA Bottler pilot? I believe you have to ask Heretics and Dalian. I don't have the final price. I was not dealing with the government directly. So you can't tell us about the target price for the enterprise implementation of the Bottler solution for the government of Canada that you were working on? No, because I, no, I do not know exactly how many people are in the, in the public servants. I don't have that number. Your commission would have been on the government of Canada-wide implementation of that project? No, because this, the deal was never done. I, 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 can't, I don't know how that number. Well, <laughs> again, why is Barrett asking these questions? Because he knows the answer. And he knows the answer because Christian Firth already provided this answer to the Butler folks. And he provided this answer in a recorded conversation. Now, we will provide a link to that recorded conversation after this because this is this is a long stream as it is and it's going to go on longer. Um, but what he said on that recording, I believe it was on the court recording, was $20 million is what the total value of that enterprise implementation of this would be across the government. And their cut... Their cut would be, I think they said 20% on this. So, 20% of $20 million, that's $4, $4 million. million. Yeah. $4 million. Glenn Stewart with a $2 super chat. He is sunk and he needs to pray. Yes, he does. He needs to pray and pay. You entered into entered into this without knowing what you'd get paid for it. It was just a, it was just <laughs> goodwill by the guy who... Um, who committed fraud to increase billing rates on resumes for some contra- subcontractors? It was just you doing a nice thing for for Bottler and the government of Canada. As I mentioned, it was not fraud; it was a mistake. And increasing that did nothing to the rates. The rates are fixed price. This is not per diem based. Sir, you you told a you you said that previously that the uh, that you are paid primarily on per diem. We know that the per diem rates are set based on the experience of the subcontractor. So Correct. how could how could it not how could it not affect how could it not affect the price by changing the experience of the person who was doing the work if it increases the per diem rate? 
it's a fixed price. It doesn't matter if the per diem was $20 or if it was $900, the fixed price for the deliverable would be 54 or whatever the number was. It doesn't go off a of time material. It goes off fixed price and the, deliverables. The changing the resume, fraudulently changing the resume to qualify someone and inflating the number of hours that they have is absolutely going to affect the price of the contract and whether or not the person's going to be able to do the contract. Well, as I mentioned, there's different categories. There would have been categories if, if after it was deemed they, they were not compliant with those, they would have been on a different category they would have been compliant for. And per teams don't matter is, on a fixed price contract. Is your testimony that you did speak with the, with the person named in those resumes, you spoke with them by telephone about the uh, changes that you made, the fraud that you committed on those resumes, you spoke to them, you, you did a no. back and forth on the telephone with them about this resume. Is that your testimony today? No, as I mentioned to the previous uh, gentleman I was speaking with, I didn't do that because of haste. The wrong one was sent in, and they were never qualified by the resources. That conversation never happened. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Baines, please, uh, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and um, uh, thank you to oh, our back, witness uh, for joining us today. Um, uh, it, uh, I think... Uh, Many have mentioned there's a lot to unpack here, and I'm not sure where to pick up here. But um, you talked a little bit about meeting Cameron McDonald in 2009. Uh, who approached who to engage Bottler in selling its software to the federal government? So, sorry, I was approached by CBSA to identify a real problem that's in the government, which was the harassment and the, the misconduct that's going on in, in multiple departments and in the armed forces and public safety. It was then suggested that maybe there must be a technology or a solution out there that could help the federal government with like an automated solution and act as a fir fir front line of defense for people that are, are going through misconduct or harassment. At that point, I identified Botner and I reached out to them and suggested we have a, we meet up and have, I can walk through some opportunities that might be available in the government of Canada. How did you identify Bottler? Like, what process did you go through? LinkedIn. To identify uh, <laughs> you went out and you looked for, because yeah, you're was, clearly someone who looks, who connects, tech, you're, you, you're a recruiter in a sense, and that's your history, and you find the, the uh, capable or able um, third-party solutions to do the work, right? Correct. So how, how, what did you? What was the process you went through there? It, it was simple bullion search, like looking, identifying with buzzwords. How to? And then after that, identifying automated solutions because they're usually easier Google to search install than actually having a team Googled. come in and, and integrate. That's and what I'm, also that's Canadian what I'm was huge Four because if they were going to be federal Googling. government contracts and doing work in for the government, they have to be able to get government security cleared. So, okay, so, so then who, who identified Bottler software as being able to meet federal requirements under the amended Canada Labour Code then? Like, and this is where you talked about a matrix, it has to be compliant, et cetera. Like, so, so then who finally said, okay, this is the one? Just got to pause for a $100 super chat by Austin Goche. Thank you so, so much. And that's your first on the live stream. Thank you very, very much for your generous donation, Austin. Thank you. Thank you very much. I bet you know how to Google better than uh, Mr. Firth here. So we had subsequent meetings with Labour Relations, uh, Corrections Canada and other ones. And so we what would go time there to be alive and indeed. Ms. Dutt would ask specific questions. I don't know, the whole time they were you know, on their website, it's, maybe they were compliant and they're completely compliant with Bill C-65. So we knew that the solution could do that. And then it was subsequent meetings we had uh, in other government departments with labor uh, personnel to identify if it would fit within there. So, But I do remember several meetings, whether it's corrections and I think Shared Services Canada, uh, with labor um, relations people. And that's how we identified that it would be suitable. How many people were involved in that process, like, like labor relations? You're, you're talking about a lot of different departments. Um, the majority of people we met with would have been HR and labor relations. And so there's a number of people that are going through this process to to make yep. a decision in the end. Well, yeah, I mean, there is cybersecurity to see if, well, how this is going to impact other things that are happening on the network. So there were several people in each meeting that would have different questions um, regarding the software. Okay, so and then just uh, 
so where does Corridex and Dalian come into the picture in this all of this at all this time? When, the, just, like, if you're time. arranging for Bottler to provide the services, so so they were never. Why did it go through? It's like these guys have been paying attention this whole time. And Dalian. Dalian. So so I was working with um, with Bottler for over a year before Dalian and Corradix even knew about it. I was there. I was getting meetings. I was uh, helping them with marketing material. We're doing sales pitch other organizations. It wasn't only until the pilot was accepted at CBSA were they contacted by the CBSA saying, we're using your contracting mechanism and GC Strategies is working with Bottler. And then that was when the, the first time that the, around the Bottler conversations, the, either party knew who we were working with. So, okay, so when we're talking about the inflated, the, the mistake that, that you made, the inflated numbers, like, uh, apart from just those inflated numbers, you talked about a matrix of other things that are, so, and, and it appears that obviously there's been a lot of different people making decisions for for this to come through. Uh, what other, what, what's, what are the other pieces of the matrix that, that need to uh, uh, asking, like, just and about 20 numbers. seconds answer, Mr. Firth. Oh, thank goodness. Yeah, it would be Thanks different technologies that they coming. may have used in the past. Um, then there could be m more functional responsibilities, like did you give team meetings? Uh, have you done presentations to senior executives? The, each matrix is different for each category. And again, has no bearing at all on the price of the deliverables. Every category for a fixed price contract has no bearing at all because that's a per diem base. This is time. This is, that's time material, and this is thanks, fixed Mr. Price. Firth. Uh, we have two and a half minutes with uh, Miss Vignola, please. Thank you, Mr. President. Get off the block. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Firth, did you make a sales pitch to Miss Brenda Lucky? No, we did not. Did you make a sales pitch to Julie Lees and Philip Johnson at Transport Canada? We did to Philip Johnson, but I'm not sure if Julie Lees attended. After those discussions, were you able to close a sale with Transport Canada or with the RCMP? Were you able to get a commission? Nope. We, we, we had subsequent meetings thereafter, but no deal was made and no commission was made. Are you a registered lobbyist? No, I'm not. I, I do not get employed by the people I work with. I don't charge a retainer or I don't charge a fee. And actually, my model is completely against lobbying acts because I want to get paid on the contract when it comes in. Okay. I'm trying to understand. You've said that you're not being investigated by the RCMP following allegations, but the RCMP is investigating misconduct by three companies that participated in the development of ArriveCan, and you are currently telling us that you are not one of those three companies? No, not at all. I'm just saying I was. I have not been contacted by the RCMP, and I've, I, last time I heard testimony here that it was clarified that the RCMP was only investigating the Butler accusations and not ArriveCan. <laughs> They're investigating the three companies. Fine. They're not investigating the three companies that were involved in Arrive Can. They're investigating the three companies that were involved in Butler, which are also the same three companies that were involved in the Arrive Can. Like, stop playing around with semantics. You and the liberals, you, you guys need to just stop because you look so foolish when you do it. You know exactly what question is being asked. Yeah. Est-ce que... Can you very quickly tell us if outside of your phone calls, did you have any other contacts with Mr. Cameron McDonald? We had uh, during ArriveCan, and there were certain applications that needed to be integrated. There was um, NFC capabilities. So there would be meetings in the CBSA offices. Thank you. Mr. Johns, please. Talk about personal meetings. Um, you described Mr. McDonald 
uh, that you've, you've known him his whole career in government, but you admitted that that was embellished. Um, is that I've correct? known him my whole career. Yep, I've known him my whole career. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, Mr. McDonald, uh, directed Butler in February, said, please work with Christian, and they've got this recorded, by the way, let Christian <laughs> work his magic. We explain what the magic is? <laughs> oh. I, mean, I, I can't speak on behalf of Cameron, but I can speculate that... Uh, I mean, some people call it magic, but I call it time and roll. Like, oh, no, so no, 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 no. What are you doing? What are you doing to yourself, Mr. Filth? You don't engage in that question. What is wrong with you? I guess he needs a better lawyer. He's a way better lawyer. <laughs> this guy's so stupid. Because he's arrogant. He thinks he can get around it, right? What he's supposed to say there is, I can't speculate as to what he means by magic. The end. But now you're speculating. Okay. Oh, government contracting is it's somewhat cumbersome okay. and okay. it's very confusing to but, clients. But you can, you can understand the appearance from Canadian taxpayers when they see a resume changed, that that might be what he's alluding to. Now, Mr. McDonald, he suggested answers for executives and he wanted to start with saying, I will start by saying that I was not per personally familiar with GC strategies during this time in question. Would, how do you feel about Mr. McDonald suggesting something like that? <laughs> so... If if you didn't catch it, um, you pr you guys probably did because you're you're very astute uh, uh, viewers and followers of this. When Mr. John said, maybe that w maybe the magic was referring to you doctoring the resumes. <laughs> uh, maybe that's what it was, and then he just quickly moved on for that. So that was a nice little backhand comment from the NDP there. Sorry, can you repeat that? You cut out a little bit, sorry. Quote, I will start by saying that I was not personally familiar with GC strategies during the time in question. Um, For Butler? Yeah, around, uh, this is what he recommended regarding Butler, or selecting a company on the ArriveCan app. app. Sorry, it's, sorry, I was I'm confused. Is it Butler or ArriveCan? Just got to flip over to the next version of this, folks. Sorry, it's, sorry, I was I'm confused. Is it Butler or ArriveCan? It is regarding uh, the hearings here in Parliament around ArriveCan. Well, GC Strategies was selected by CBSA and PSVC. I, I cannot tell you who that person was that selected us, but we went. We were selected by CBSA and PSVC. Mr. Utano? Again, I, I cannot tell you who the person was at CBSA that directed oh, okay. us you, you from PSVC. Remember. Have you met Ms. Daly before? I have had an email exchange with Miss Daly. I've met with Miss Daly. Isn't that interesting? Miss Daly is the one who um, allegedly blackmailed Butler to turn over all evidence of misconduct before they got paid. That's what that if I have that correct, that's what was in the Butler testimony. So that's interesting and not surprising that he knew her. Yeah, I think the day after uh, Botler filed their first complaint, Ms. Daly wrote you and asked you to pay Botler, and the next day you did. I have a question. Botler alleges that you said that the resulting price increase would suck for Canadians. Did you say that? Sorry, can you repeat that? Botler alleged during the, the resulting price increase on the contract that this would suck for Canadians. But uh, in, a, in a... I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with that at all. So I, You're not familiar. I, is there nope. anything that you, you, you that you, you could tell this committee that you may not have told us that you think you should? I think you're going to have to say that for your question for your next round, Mr. Johns, but I certainly understand. Mr. Brock, for five minutes, please. Yes. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Mr. Uh, Firth, I'm sure that uh, the millions of Canadians who either are watching this or will learn about this in the press or sure will. seek out the uh, transcript the of this stream. particular meeting will be very, very grateful that the RCMP has access to this particular evidence. Oh, uh, that's a threat. What I, what I can understand. That's a threat. <laughs> that is a threat. Holy... Just to give you a bit more anxiety, Mr. Firth, here you go. And am I mistaken, or is it kind of like a backhanded comment oh, about it is. the SNC-Lavalin affair? Uh, kind of, yeah. Kind yeah. Of. <laughs> and is why you would 
take active steps in misleading this particular committee and Canadians with respect to your role as it relates to fraud and uh, forgery with respect to modifying without permission and consent these uh, transcripts, not sorry transcripts, but the resumes to the government. What I can't understand is why you would deliberately lie to this committee on a very innocent question that was put to you by my colleague, uh, Mr. Barrett, when he asked you if you knew whether or not Mr. Cameron McDonald from the CBSA had a cottage. And you said no. Do you want Mr. to reflect Mr. on that answer? <laughs> Uh-oh. Yeah, Mr. Um, McDonald has never referred to it as a cottage. It's a chalet. It's not... Oh, oh my, my God. God. Is this what you guys were talking about? Oh, my God. What an asshole. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. You did not just say that to Mr. Brock. You did not. You you are screwed. He's boned. We got a six ninety nine super chat from Johnny O. Mr. Brock is going to make a fine attorney general very, <laughs> very, very soon. Brock on. Oh, that's why he's the shadow minister yes. of justice. Oh my God. What are you doing? Oh, this guy just like dug his own grave. Oh no. Okay. Let's let's watch it begin. The cottage. <laughs> for that clarification, Mr. First. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, oh, my God. I am not disappointed. <laughs> I am so grateful for that clarification. Uh, Jarsa with a $20 super chat. Again, thank you so much. Mr. Firth, go outside, breathe in that fresh autumn air. Go spend some of that stolen money taken by... Uh, taking your family to a fancy restaurant and spend the day enjoying being free might be your last chance for a few decades let's hope so oh my god oh okay here we go are you kidding me wow that is the only are you saying you knew all Mr. along Mr. that he had something that that was equivalent to a cottage or a cabin but because yes. a different Sorry. word was, was used to refer to it, that you had the license to say, I don't know. Okay, so like the other MPs are just giving no Fs anymore. Bar Barrett's sitting there. He's, like, he's just shaking his head, say, says, that's a lie. That's a lie. Here's the, okay. Most of you probably know this already, so I uh, apologize if I'm patronizing any of you. But... When you're giving testimony before a committee, before anyone, before a police officer, before your wife. <laughs> Especially before anyone, your wife. Anyone. If you get caught in a lie, it undermines everything else that you've said. Everything else that you've said. And Brock brings up a very, very excellent point here. If you are willing to lie about something so small as a chalet versus a cottage, then it calls into question everything else that you've said. Now, they already know because they have evidence that he's lied about other things. But anything that may have been truthful... It's out the window now. And the liberals, I guarantee you, they're back in their chairs away from their desks saying, I don't, I don't, want, I don't want to ask you more questions. <laughs> like, <laughs> they, they are not going to want to be near this. Oh, my goodness. You've just pissed off the crown prosecutor and he is coming for blood now. Thank you to Jerry Savoy for a $2 super chat. A bunch of dinner plates and forks and knives. It says plate time. And then Ryan Peplinski with a six ninety nine super chat. I tuned in for Fox's reaction. It was exactly what I imagined. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I didn't disappoint. Oh my! And look at look at the just look at the look on Barrett's face. He's he's just like we got him, we got him, we freaking got him. Well, look at the look on Brock's face. How you've paused it. It's just like he's disgusted. Like look. 
Uh. Wow. Wow. Anyway, I'm going to stop saying wow and just we're, we're just going to keep going. Sorry, I'm still digesting this, everyone. You know, you saw you saw Clyde's mind blown when we blew his mind on that live stream. My mind has just been split into a million pieces here that this guy is so stupid to do this. You were asking is that what you want us to believe? Of, you were asking a specific question about a cottage. I answered honestly. He has never mentioned that he had a cottage. This guy hasn't said anything honest since he's been here. But he's got a cabin, doesn't he? <laughs> was that Barrett? <laughs> yes, that was Barrett. This guy hasn't said anything honest since he's been here. That's what Barrett said. Not a boy. Chalet. A chalet. <laughs> well, why didn't you offer that? Because that was not the question that was asked. I see. Oh. I see. So you have a very limited ability in terms of telling this committee the truth. Is that correct, Mr. Firth? No, I'm answering Because the, the RCMP correctly. is going to have a field day when they come to interview you. That's right. I answered the question honestly with the question that was posed in front of me. I see. Wow. Well, let's ask you some more questions. Then. <laughs> have you ever had or claimed to have influence on any government officials? No, I have not. Do you remember, sir, some of the allegations that uh, you have probably read about by Bottler that they've actually taped conversations with you? Hours and hours of conversations with you? Do you want to reflect seen, on that question again? No, I've seen everything that you've said. Uh, everything that was in the newspaper is what I've read. Well, sir, I'll remind you what you said on audio tape that has been recorded. You told Bottler during the very first call on November the 8th, 2019. These are uh -oh. your words. Quote, so we have um, essentially the ear of the, of the president right now of CBSA, which is, I guess, really the equivalent of the minister or like the deputy minister um, and my client who is, who is leading um, he, he, he's a very high executive responsible for innovation cloud, end of quote, Another quote, for the next step of getting the proposal over to the president, because this will land on his desk 100 percent like this is going, you know, above the ADM level. If that's not influence or claiming to have influence on any government official, sir, I don't know what is. So I'm going to ask you again, do you want to be truthful or not to this committee? Or do you want to continue to lie that you did not exaggerate or claim that you had this great influence over officials at the CBSA? Yes or no? Oh, my God. <laughs> Can you imagine? Like, I, 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 want, I want to tell him that I have influence over government officials because I feel guilty with Brock coming at me like that. <laughs> Like holy god! <laughs> okay, I know. I know. We said we weren't gonna <laughs> talk about message in chat, but Elki, that's gold. My cottage identifies as a chalet. That's amazing. <laughs> oh my god! Yeah, my mind's still blown. Like I'm just sitting here shaking my head. Like, what did I just witness? I don't know how we're gonna decide on a short. To be honest, there's so much in here. Just make all of them. Yeah, they're all shorts. Well, technically, this is one big long short, but yeah, you know, we'll cut up the one big long short into many shorts. But holy moly, and the way Brock's just coming at him, like he's ruthless. He's ruthless. But you know what? He's being ruthless for Canadians. That's the thing that I I, I sit here and and I remind myself when I'm watching him. This is this is a man and this is a team working for us. And I'm so damn proud of the, of the work that they're doing right now. I am so damn proud. And I encourage each of you, write a letter. It doesn't matter if, it's, if, if they're your MP or not. Write a letter, an individual letter, to each of these people that are the conservatives sitting on this committee. And just thank them for this. 
It will make their day. I promise you. And it doesn't even have to be a letter letter. And it doesn't even have to be really long. It can just be a couple sentences. Like our friend David Sweet told us, you know, he used to love getting those, those emails that, you know, you're doing a good job. Keep it up. Because they hardly ever get those. And most, when they do, it's awesome. Most of the emails that, that, that members of parliament get are not nice emails. So it really means a lot to them when you tell them they're doing a good job. And before we get back to it, I just noticed Kevin Taylor with a $5 super chat. Thank you so much. I wish I had enough faith in the RCMP to think that they actually will have a field day with this guy. Well, time will tell. The liberals aren't impeding their investigation, so I imagine they will. I was working with one person who I Answer the question. The... Let's start wow. with that. Answer the question. Whoa. Yes or no? Do you, uh, do you agree that this is your words that you uttered to Bottler on November 8th, 2019, bragging about your influence on government officials? Do you accept that or not? Yes or no? Yes. Thank you. Whoa. Thanks very much. Wow. Mr. Sousa, for five minutes, please. Well, I guess you can't do anything else when you're backed into a corner like that. Well, see, some people at least have a bit of a spine. This guy has zero spine whatsoever. This guy has a piece of cooked spaghetti for a spine. <laughs> he's sleazy. Because he just, he, he, again, he's a 12-year-old boy when Brock's talking to him. I think we're all 12-year-old boys when Brock's talking to uh, us. There you go. <laughs> Uh, you might be on mute, Mr. Sousa. Oh, no. Sousa. Oh, this guy. Mr. Sousa, it wasn't a right can, right? Your headset is muted. Look at the conservatives in the top left. They're just like, can you believe this guy? <laughs> How's that? Oh. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Can you hear me? Hey, go ahead, please. Okay, um, Mr. Firth, you said you've been at this for over 20 years? Since 2009, 2008. Under various administrations? Correct. And various uh, bureaucrats and civil servants over that period of time? Correct. And you've been doing it the same way throughout that process? That's correct. You've been a qualified vendor since 2015? That is correct. Under this scenario? And how many subcontractors do you have thereabouts? Today? Yeah. Um, probably 30, 25, 30 right now. And uh, when you deal with them, is there, like, understandably with Bottler, you didn't have a fee. You didn't establish a fee with Bottler. Correct. Correct. But you do establish fee with other subcontractors when you go forward? Yep. It's very, as mentioned previously before, it's that there's no flat number. You have a bill rate to the client to work with, and you have a pay rate for the resource. The difference, the delta between he, is the margin. Yeah, should we cover? Yes, is he, the fee. He, he will try right. to hang this on some of the conservatives. So, Butler's made reference. I don't know who he's... But he can't. He absolutely can't because he just became a qualified vendor as GC Strategies in 2015. He worked for staffing agencies earlier than that, but he's only been a qualified vendor for the government since 2015. Coincidentally, when the Liberals took power. Isn't that interesting? Darsha with a $10 super chat. Thank you so much. I hope one of the first things Pierre does once elected is give Brock all the people and resources he needs to jail all these crooks and get as much stolen money back as possible before uh, they go to ground. Well, we'll see what happens. We can hope. Who they're talking about. But are you the ghost or is that somebody else? Who's this ghost I, contractor? I still don't fully understand what that terminology means. But the reality is from what I understood when I was listening to the testimony, it's somebody that appears on a TA and doesn't do the work but claims to get paid, which exactly is what Ms. Dutt did on the Butler one. She was named on the TA and openly in testimony said that she was not the one doing the work, but then did accept payment. So when you... What? Are you seriously sitting there trying to say that Ms. Dutt was the ghost contractor? It's her company, you moron. Her and Mr. Morv. What is wrong with you? You know, why am I surprised? Every single thing. He, he thinks, you know, a, a cottage is not a chalet. Why am I surprised? 
I am no longer surprised. Let's go. Made reference to the embellished resumes. Was that in regards to the pilot project? Correct. So it's had nothing to do with and the right Are you saying that that resume made a difference or did not make a difference in getting the approval of the contract? It was already predetermined that the contract was going through. They just, it, if it, we would just have would have found the right resume, the right uh, matrix and the right category, but they still would have gone through because there was other ones. There was 14, I think 12 or 14 different categories that would have allowed this to go through. Hear that Freudian slip? We just need to find the right resume. He started to say that, and then he was, uh, uh, the right matrix. Yeah. And Bonner's expectations and some of the discussions that I think we've had, they're anticipating some much bigger payoff on this deal. Is that correct? There was conversations about the euphoric state of being an enterprise sale, but there was never any promise to that. That was just ultimately what you always expire to get. So they had no contacts or no ability to deal with CBSA if it was not for you? Correct. And you're the one that brought them in? Yeah, I mean, I'm, my network allows us to open the door, but that doesn't guarantee a contract. They still need to sell the software, and the organization still needs to find a need for it. Why would you sign a confidentiality agreement after the fact with Butler? Because is it... There was, I had nothing to hide. I didn't think there was going to be this coming against me. And it, it makes sense now with all this information that's being brought forward of recordings from day one, text messages, sharing emails, that they would want to have just you know, essentially allow me not to respond. Um, does anyone get the feeling that Mr. Sousa is Christian first defense lawyer? <laughs> it's kind of what I get. But I will say that... I know Butler had signed an NDA to protect their intellectual property in January of this year, which is, it's common. It's not, you know, it's not, a, it's not uncommon for, for companies to do that. Well, why would they not, right? Why yeah. would, why would they not ensure that GC Strategies signs an NDA to protect their IP, their intellectual property? Because otherwise that would potentially allow GC Strategies to turn around and sell it. To right. somebody else. Right. And it's not an uncommon thing to do when you're working with a different company. You'd sign what's it called? A double NDA where Mutual NDA. Mutual NDA where, you know, you're saying, Okay, we're not gonna steal your secrets and you're not gonna steal ours. Yeah. So you can try and spin this however you want, Sousa, but it's just making you and thereby your colleagues look complicit. But you are responding. Um and you're you're aware now that RCMP is investigating the issues, the allegations made by Butler, but not a ride can. Correct? Correct. Correct. <laughs> and there yet it you is. haven't been approached by RCMP. Correct. But you have been approached by CBSA because they've done an internal review. Have they not? Have they talked to you? No, they didn't. But they would speak only with the, the vendor they're dealing with. Which was not Dalian your, and, your... and Karatix. All right. Because you're the subcontractor to Dalian and Karatix. Correct in this scenario. And you're saying in this pilot, you made no money. It was just a flow through. Correct. I made no money with Butler in the whole two years I worked with them. Um, and so what was confidential that you had to sign? Like, I don't understand. Like, it was, like, all, what it, was it was like all electronic communications back and forth between myself and Butler, uh, text messages, uh, documents that had any of our names on it, anything that had any presentational material, um, two pagers, anything that really essentially mentioned the word Butler and involved myself or the federal government. And why would Butler not want that divulged? Because obviously they're now making allegations and complaining that they weren't paid, but you're saying that in fact they didn't do the work that was required. Yeah, they were paid in full for the two deliverables that are accepted and they never, because CBSA deemed the, the remaining four substandard, they were never paid. That's a lie. Okay, so what Sousa is trying to do right here, what Sousa is trying to do is do a character assassination on Butler. So what he's trying to frame here is that the only reason Butler is doing what they're doing is because they were able to, in his words, or in his mind, silence Christian Firth, prohibit him from speaking against it. He's saying that Butler was peed off, that they weren't paid, and this is the only reason why they're coming forth and raising a big stink on this. That's what basically Sousa is trying to say. 
Why is he trying to be on Firth's side? What advantage does that provide to him and or the Liberal Party? Because he probably knows that there's other colleagues in the Liberal government that are implicated in this. Ah. So he is trying to defuse that at the beginning, which he's not going to succeed. He's trying to defuse this right at the start so there, it doesn't go anywhere further up the chain. That's what Sousa seems to be trying to do here. The problem that Sousa has is Christian Firth is on record as admitting to fraud. Intentional or not, it's fraud. So th there's that's a big problem. Well, and we know from Butler's testimony last week that the reason they weren't paid was not because the CBSA said, oh, this is garbage. We don't, we don't want to continue this project. It's because they would not hand over the evidence that showed all of this. And again, I remind everybody that Miss Daly, after ArriveCan was finished, was transferred out of the PSPC agency and is now in Health Canada. John Oswowski was moved out quote unquote retired out of the CBSA and is now no longer working in government. Cameron McDonald was promoted out of CBSA, now works for another agency. So you have all these people being moved around as after this shenanigans happened. So I don't think that's coincidence that all these major players have done. And we have a $2 super chat from David Edwards. The NDA was, in fact, for the IP. You are correct. Yep. Yeah. And you can be very specific in, in non-disclosure agreements. So it all depends on what Botler put in there. Yeah, that is, and how would you and, and we I'm were sorry, never paid is, either. I'm sorry. That is our five minutes. Um, we might have another opportunity in the next round. Mr. Genuis for five, please. Uh, just briefly back to the resumes. Uh, I think I understand your process. You said that you, you receive the resumes, you make them compliant before sending them, but then check in with resources to make sure your edits are okay. Is that is that how you describe the process? Correct. Okay. So if I'm a potential subcontractor, I send you a resume. It says I have, say, four months of IT experience. The contract requires four years of IT experience. So you change the four months to four years to make it compliant. Then you check in with me and say, hey, is it okay that I made this change before sending it? Is that right? It's actually identifying. It's more of a case for me as well to identify if they can even pass the grid. Can you just answer the question? Like you, you, you said... You said you check in, if you make it compliant, then you check with the resource if that's okay with them. So the big problem this witness has right now is that the conservatives have identified that they can bully an answer out of him because he has no spine. So they know that they can push him to get the answer that they know that he has and get it out of him. They know that he's not going to try and skate around to any significant degree and uh, they know that they can keep them on course some witnesses they you know it's very difficult they keep going they keep going they keep going and they refuse to answer the questions but they know that they can do that with this guy they've established that especially after the torching that Brock gave him so like you don't hear this too often where they're 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 ha ha hammering on a witness to answer a question like that but they've identified that they can do that so um no doubt they were caucusing in the uh, in the corner there when we saw them about how they were going to approach the next rounds of questions and this is the result and correct me if i'm wrong but if there are criminal proceedings they can use this as evidence can they not it is it, this is admissible as evidence absolutely so you change the four months to four years, you check in with me, you see if it's okay, and then if it's okay with me, you send it on the basis, no, no, presumably, no. that I've signed off on it. I check in with you, but if there's too much, like, at this point, we're going to identify if it's just not even feasible to be that to be in this category. Right, which but is you, why you, but you which make is it, why you do the version. But you, this is right, why you do the right, version. But you do the revised version by changing the numbers to make it compliant, then you check in with the resource, and then you send it in, right? 
it's also an exercise for myself to see how sure, far sure, stretched this is. Sure. And that, but then okay. it's important, though. Okay, but, you, important. but that but that exercise involves changing the numbers, right? It does, but that, excellent. I can do that. For well, myself. not excellent actually, but myself. thank you for clarifying. Oh. So, in the case of of the he folks so uh, with Butler, though, you you were working so quickly that you missed a step. So you just changed the numbers intentionally. You changed the numbers, but you didn't have time to check in with them, and you just sent in the resume without without checking in with them. So that that doesn't sound to me like a mistake. That that just sounds to me like um, <laughs> like cooking the numbers. That's exactly what we say. <laughs> It doesn't sound like a mistake at all. Exactly. Exactly, Genuous. Oh, I, to me, it was an honest mistake, and I'm apologizing. No, I mean, it's, it's, it's a mistake in a moral sense, but I don't, I don't think it's a practical mistake. Like, you've described a process in which you change the numbers as a matter of routine. Yeah. But right? given more time, we're given more time and not de- like, uh, executing in haste, I would have identified that this resource would not have met this grid and therefore okay. would have gone back to Dalian Karatics and asked for a different category. But, but it's obviously a problem that you change the numbers and then you go back and ask permission. Like, in, in, in some cases, it, it, it's, it's great that Butler did the right thing here and has blown the whistle. But in, in many cases, if you're, if you're routinely changing the numbers, people may shrug and say it's okay based on you telling them it's okay when, when obviously it's not. Uh, I, I, have, I have some additional questions though, sir, I want to I wanna ask you. Um, you had uh, said in response to a previous question, you'd been asked, have you ever met Mark Briard, former CTO of Canada in a hotel? Um, and you had said at the time, no. Uh, do you have any interest in correcting re- that answer? No, oh, I said I don't recollect. I cannot remember every meeting I've had with everybody in the last 12 years. I'm sorry. I, don't, I can go back into my outlook and give you the answer okay, in that's, writing. That, I, that, I that, that, that's, that's, that's a different answer than you gave. We could, we could check an A-tip that you submitted to find out that actually you did meet with him uh, in, a, in a hotel, sir. Uh, that is A-tip A20180247. Ironically, the A-tip came from you. Uh, oh, what? wow. Wow, wow, wow. Oh, my goodness. Oh, snap. There's bombs going off all around yeah, this I guy. Yeah, I think my brains are, like, on the ceiling from, like, having my mind blown. Dude. <laughs> this is, like, this is like the climax to Law and Order. I think his lawyer is going to res- call him tomorrow and say, no, I'm done. <laughs> I watched I'm your not testimony. fixing this mess, I'm yeah. done. And by the way, you owe me my five thousand dollars. Holy! And again, like they they can hold him in contempt, everybody, because they've proven that he's lied multiple times. They could hold him in contempt of Parliament as well. So, um, yeah, sir, we're just sitting here like stunned. Yeah. So here's the thing. I wonder if anyone has asked Mark Brouillard if he's met with Mr. Firth in the past. And I wonder if they have asked him, I wonder what he said. But that's a big problem because remember one of the other questions that they asked, and this was a leading question. All of these questions they knew the answers to. One of the other questions they asked Mr. Firth very early on was, and I think it was by Mr. Barrett, was, have you met with any government officials off government time, not on government premises? And he said, no. David Edwards for $2 says it was a motel, not a hotel. It was a motel, (laughs) not a hotel. That's amazing. But, um, so that was, that was actually the, the foundation laid for the next question. Uh, 279 uh, Super Chat by Ryan Paplinksy. Thank you very much. Can he get a plea deal to rat at the Liberals? Oh, he could. He could. Um, it depends. Not if Brock was a prosecutor. Yeah, it, <laughs> He'd it, want it, him it, all in jail. It depends on the scope of the investigation that has already been put together. If the scope starts to include higher level liberal officials and they're having somewhat of a difficult time to get evidence on them, but they know there's evidence there and they know there's charges there, they could go to Christian Firth and say, hey, um, if you give us some information regarding these liberals that can qualify as evidence, we'll give you a plea deal. So that could happen. It just depends on the scope of the investigation. Um, Yeah, if they're pretty confident that they can get Firth and they can get whoever these liberal 
officials may or may not be, then there's no sense in doing a, uh, a plea deal because they've got the dirt they need or they've got the evidence they need. So, uh, yeah. Interesting. Wow. Um, and I was thinking as this was going on, I wonder, I wonder how Christian Firth is feeling about his partner showing up 45 minutes late to committee. I wonder if they're going to be partners tomorrow <laughs> <laughs> because he's been left in front of the firing squad by himself this whole time. Like, wow. Um, and uh, for those wondering, ATIP, ATIP stands for Access to Information Privacy. Um, so anyone can actually do this. You could submit a Access to Information uh, Privacy request to the government for anything regarding yourself. So you can say, I want all email communication from any government official regarding me specifically. And they would have to comply with that depending on the agency. Now, some agencies are going to say, well, we don't have any information, so that's a useless exercise. But um, because, because Mr. Firth knows how this works, he can, he went to whatever agency Mr. Brilliard was in at the time and said, I want an, uh, I'm, I'm filing an ATIP request for any meetings that I've had with Mark Brilliard. So that what they would have done is they would have given that to the IT folks. They would have gone through the email system in the government, pulled or ran a search of Christian Firth and his email address, pulled that out and provided all of the meetings out of Mark Brilliard's calendar to Mr. Firth. So that's what would have happened and that's how he would have received that information, which is why they're asking this question about that specific specific instance of a meeting with Mark, Mr. Mark Brilliard. Again, these guys are asking questions that they already know the answer to in order to trap him. Mm -hmm. So. And before we continue, we have a $2 super chat from Eat Me. Surprised they are wearing poppies to begin with. Surprised who's wearing poppies, sorry. I'm not sure, like everybody, or because that's actually government policy that you have to, so. You, 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 we've gone back and forth about this cottage versus chalet uh, issue. Um, ha have, you ever, have you ever been to this infamous cottage or chalet that is owned Never. by Mr. McIntosh? Never. Never, okay. <laughs> um, I, think, I, think, I think there'll be some follow-up on that. <laughs> Jesus. Uh oh. Uh, Shred, del Shed Dwelling Hermit, uh, thank you very much for five uh, gifted Northern Perspective uh, memberships. Congratulations to the five random people who's received it. <laughs> Genuous. Uh, have you ever been there at uh, Chalet or, or Cottage? Never. Okay. Well, I think there's going to be some follow up. On that. Like, Christian, when are you going to realize that there's a reason for these questions? They're not just pulling them out of their butts. Okay. They're asking you these questions because they know the answers to them. And by the way, they've they they they're summoning Cameron McDonald to committee as well, just so everybody knows. I can't wait for that one. Did they summon him, or is he coming willingly? Well, they're after this. Yeah, it, it's not going to matter. <laughs> it's not going to matter. It, it feels a little bit like we're on the Maury show here. Um, <laughs> now, uh, oh, one, uh, going back to uh, October uh, 20th, your appearance before Man, the committee uh, la last year, uh, you had said, we are not in any conversations for budgeting or cost controls. We have quality control. If a resource isn't performing, uh, we will then work with the government to replace that. So you're not, not involved in uh, conversations on budgeting or cost control. You told the committee that a year ago. Sir, was that, uh, was that true, what you told the committee at that time? Yes. It was, okay. Uh, the Globe and Mail was able to get access to an email you sent, though, on January 26, 2021. Uh, in that email, uh, you talked explicitly about uh, budgeting. You said CBSA, uh, quote, CBSA were pissed at the overall pricing and threatened to pull the contract. You said your cost plus 15% for me and 20% Coradex, et cetera, arose close to 500000 uh, uh, I was not prepared to slow down the, uh, the process down and stop our first client from purchasing, so I removed myself from the equation completely, and I gave them a 15% uh, discount. 
account attached is a, is a contract that shows it, et cetera. So, so you're sending emails that actually provide explicit budgeting information. So um, given that we've, we've now put that uh, email on the record, would you be prepared to admit that what you told the committee on October 20th regarding budgeting was in fact also a lie? So, sorry, no, but this, is, this was about a RifeCan, was a specific question you asked me on a RifeCan saying, are you responsible for contracting or budgeting on a RifeCan? And the answer is uh, not, not at all. I was not even responsible for this response here to be anything to do with budget control. I'm just, I removed myself from the deal, therefore giving, like giving the Crown a discount. That's not, that's you, not budget you said, control. You said you were involved in the budgeting. That is our time, Genwin. Uh, Ms. Uh, Atwin, please, for five minutes. Damn. The hits just keep on coming. And the, just the, the look in Christian's face, he's hes just turned into a deer with the headlights. Like, I, I wonder if he's just sitting there having heart palpitations as this is going. Holy moly. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, so, Mr. Firth, the, the federal government has various policies, regulations, and directives that ensure the procurement process is transparent and carried out with integrity. Um, and we're certainly here to make sure that we continue to do this. So, as a supplier, are you familiar with these policies? You know, she better start asking questions about Indigenous services, considering she's the Parliamentary Secretary for Indigenous Services. She better start asking questions about that. Yeah, you would think that would be top of mind. You would think. $2 from Eat Me, uh, uh, Don Cherry Poppy, why do you ask why? Just because it wasn't clear? I don't know. I'm not sure what that's referring to, but okay, fine. Thank you very much. Yes, I am. So in pursuing federal contracts, have you ever asked for clarity on the government's contracting rules by posing questions um, to a contracting officer or through another mechanism? No, we, we just, we have those integrities and provisions we have to sign whenever we're submitting an RFP. That, that enforces ethics and insurance that it was everything was done professionally and properly. So the code of conduct for procurement um, it applies to all vendors and their subcontractors sub subcontractors who respond to bid solicitations and or provide goods and services to Canada. In fulfilling the terms of their contracts, vendors and their subcontractors are required to comply with all applicable laws and regulations. How have you demonstrated a duty of good faith and honest performance uh, before and during any procurement process with the federal government that you've been a party to as a vendor or subcontractor? Um, what? What kind of a generalized question is that? And I think the problem is, is Christian is so beat down, he doesn't realize this is a softball for him to hit out of the park. So let's see how we respond. Sorry, can you repeat that, please? I'm getting, I can't hear you very well. No, you just, you are so screwed up from the beatdown that you've gotten from the conservatives. You don't understand. This is a softball for you to hit. Sure. So it's, so underneath the code of conduct for procurement, uh, which applies to all vendors and their subcontractors. Um, so how have you demonstrated a, a duty of good faith and honest performance uh, before and during any procurement process with the federal government that you've been party to? Well, sometimes when we submit a bid, we also get permission to bid from the resources because often, typically, whenever there's an RFP that comes out that's competitive, a lot of our comp competitors will go and submit the same people. So what we would do oh. our bids when we can is um, we always submit a, typically we'll submit a permission to bid to ensure that the resource knows they're being represented properly and correctly. And did you do that in this circumstance? We didn't, the bid would already be competitive. So uh, the, it was a contract that had already been awarded to Dallin and Karatek, so it wasn't a new contract. Okay. Um, a public services and procurement Canada official, they told Bottler that this was a matter internal to Bottler, GC Strategies, Dallin, and Karatek. Do you agree with this assessment? What was the matter regarding? So the fact that the, the CBSA is investigating um, alleged misconduct and they're saying that this is an internal matter between these entities. Do you agree with that? I can, yeah, I can agree with that. Okay. So then in your view, what, what gaps does this reveal in the federal contracting process? Um, I, don't, I don't think it reveals any. I mean, the, the reality was it would have been a perfect execution if the four deliverables were done on time and were of the standard that CBSA would have approved and paid. It would have been a perfect execution if Butler would have just shut up and done what they were told. Yeah, and handed over all that evidence instead of, you know, blowing this entire thing wide open. 
God, I can't believe this yeah. guy. And uh, and David Edwards with a five dollar super chat. He earlier said it was a fixed price. So then, how did it get more expensive? So the government wasn't happy. That's not fixed. Uh, that's time and material. Well, so so that's that's partly true as far as I understand it, David. So the part that is is a problem for me is that if if he had already agreed with Cameron McDonald on the price of three hundred and fifty thousand, um, then that's the price. That's what should have gone to Dalian. The problem is, is the price increased by seventy thousand dollars to four hundred and twenty thousand because Dalian wanted their cut. That's not the way it's supposed to work. The contract's the contract's a contract. So if it was agreed upon to be 350, a responsible director general at a government agency would then, you know, be told by Dalian, well, you know, we, uh, this has to go up to 420 because we got to get paid. And the director general would be like, no, it's 350,000. You guys figure it out. This is taxpayer money. And I'm not going to rob them just to give you a little bit of money because you're the one holding the budget. Because that's basically what Dalian was paid to be, is just a budget holder. That's it. They got paid money to do nothing. Literally nothing. They did less nothing than the nothing that Christian Firth and GC Strategies did. So, um, so that's that part. Um, now, the government wasn't happy because allegedly, according to Christian Firth, on this deliverable-based contract. So a deliverable-based contract um, is very specific. Sometimes it says that you have to complete things within X time frame. Mostly, it is you have to complete these specific things, like a house, right? You know, you're paying a contractor to come in. You're paying them to build a bathroom and the bathroom has to have a toilet it has to have a shower it has to have a sink so if the contractor finishes and there's no sink well you're not going to pay them the entire amount of money for that bathroom right because they didn't put in a sink so you could kind of dictate that as a deliverable based contract even though that's not actually outlined in the contract when it comes to this type of stuff it deliverables it's very easy you're going to deliver this app and it's going to have these pieces of functionality and it's going to have this security and it's going to have, you know, this, this, and this. So that would all be a deliverables based. So what he's saying is of the six deliverables that were in this contract, Bottler completed two of them, therefore they got paid. And the other four that they completed, they're saying that the CBSA wasn't happy with and therefore that's why they didn't get paid. The problem is, is people have talked to people in CBSA and that's not their understanding. Okay. So, um, hopefully I explained that well. Uh, Ktanada with a 279 super chat. Your new avatars are awesome. Heart and Apple. Thank you. We've been getting kind of mixed feedback about them, but we're, we're quite happy with them. Yeah. Um, I think overall yeah. we've had good feedback. So yeah. anyhow, um, so let's get back to, uh, Mr. Filth. This was, this was not a contracting issue. This was a performance issue. Okay. Um, and so you mentioned also that your, your work through GC Strategies, um, and, you know, engaging the kind of pathfinding services that you provide, um, that, it, that it all stays within the PSBC guidelines. So do you think anything should be changed regarding these guidelines after this experience? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I th again, like I said, I tried to work with Botner to get them on a, so they could be built direct to the federal government. I think that these, it's, and my understanding is this, these processes were put in place in 2003. They haven't really changed much until now. And I think there just needs to be a better ability. If they want to uh, eliminate the, the middleman or what they're saying or, or a vendor, then they should have the, the, the ability to invoice or go directly to some of these people who, who have the software and they have the product. But okay. unfortunately, at this point, that doesn't exist. Um, so where Bottler AI was not a qualified vendor, what, what were they missing just based on your assessment? What, what criteria do they not meet um, to, to become a qualified vendor on their own right? Well, it's, it's pretty arduous. 
that you have to at least be in business for probably one to two years and build up your corporate references and get projects in the private sector or work through other people. At that point, you're deemed qual your qualifications, which will get you on TBIPs, THS, uh, ProServe, SBIPs. And at that point, you're then eligible and qualified vendor to then go after competitive RFPs that are posted on Buy and Sell or Ariba. Okay. Um, and just in general, you know, have you learned anything from this experience? Was, was there anything you would do differently uh, to not kind of end up before us here today? <laughs> Are you kidding me? Are you ki That's your question? Dude's, dude's admitted to committing fraud. He's committed, he's, he's admitted to lying to this committee. And you're asking him, So, um, would you do anything differently? To avoid coming before this committee today, okay? Yeah, but come on, liberals are used to wasting taxpayer money. They don't care. Yeah, so they might as well waste questions. Like, <laughs> come on. <sighs> okay. Yeah, I would. Uh, I would probably at this point only work with uh, directly with the federal government, and. You know, eliminate the middleman, essentially. <laughs> really? You are the middleman, you knob. Eliminate the middleman. And, uh, you know, not maybe I wouldn't forward on forged resumes. I'd, I'd, I'd continue to do that. And I wouldn't defraud the taxpayer, maybe? Come on. Yeah. This guy, man. I, li I like I like writing forged resumes, okay? Resumes, middleman's bad. Middleman's bad, okay. Um, and uh, Mr. Johns asked you a question just before his time was cut off. Just as far as if there's anything else you'd like to tell us, if there's something that we need to know, um, any points of clarification. I mean, the, the cottage chalet thing is raising a bit of concern for me. So is there anything else you'd like to add to the record right now for our knowledge? No, I mean, not right now. There's nothing. Okay. That's all for me, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Ms. Atwin. Uh, Ms. Vignola for two and a half minutes, please. Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Firth, have you suggested to a subcontractor that they would receive a certain sum of money from another contract that they have not yet received? Sorry, can you clarify that question? I don't think I understand the question. So, one of your subcontractors works on Project A for a department. Has it happened to you to say to that subcontractor that they would succeed in receiving more money but for, a, for Project B that they're not wor working on? We, we, we only ever invoice the federal government for work completed that's been signed off by a federal government employee. So you've never made any promises to anyone? Again, we only invoice for work completed and signed off by the federal government. I'm not asking you about what you're invoicing. I'm asking what you promise, what you suggest to your subcontractors. I'm sorry. I, I, I've, I have to no recollection have I ever had these conversations. Oh, well, it's a good thing they're all recorded. Earlier, my colleague asked you whether or not you had received any funds through the contract with, but, or rather, with Dalian and Karatix, and you said that you hadn't received any money for the two years worked with Butler, but the question was if you had received a commission by Dalian and Karatix for the work completed for them. No, I did not receive any money from Italian Democratics. Donc vous avez été un... So you were a subcontractor that was not paid. Is that what we're to understand? You did this pro bono? No, my, my intentions were to collect a fee, but that didn't work out. So I did not make any money on this contract. Thank you, Mr. John. <laughs> Mailed. <laughs> <laughs> That's what she's thinking. Oh, 
God, she's like that ant with the death stare. She is not buying what he's selling. Holy moly. Uh, and that sound wasn't a drop pen. That, that sound is the mic turning off. That was her like slapping her her mic her mic yeah. to turn it off I, she she is she not was, happy yeah she was pissed and she didn't even say like thank you or anything just look straight at the chair like okay i'm done like this guy is just a shyster like they they all see it no money on this contract but you emailed miss uh miss dutt and you put i'm gonna read the quote let it slide and look out to the next one and recover is that correct that is correct so this is contract performance fraud. It is invoicing for work done on other projects. Do you deny this written evidence, or are you saying this means something else? I'm, I'm saying it means something else. It, 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 What's it the mean? The truth is, it, it means that in sales, you win some and you lose some. I, I was continuous to represent uh, Butler and the partnership, and keep even when I would make zero dollars, I was still trying to get them sales. This was nothing to do with making it up on the next one. It's just understanding that hopefully there will be a next one, and I'll make the 50, fifteen or the commission I will on that one. This is not adding a uh, paying for a CBSA's commission. I missed out on the next one. That was never ever, ever the interpretation. Right. Well, when you say recover, that also means reclaim. So recover. That implies that you're going to add that on top of the next contract, inflating the value of that contract. And I honestly don't believe that he didn't make any money on, on uh, which was it? The, it wasn't the Arrive Can contract. It was the $14,000 that went missing. I think that money went to him. I don't think it went missing. I think he took it. Yeah, of course. Of course he did. He needed to get paid something. Yeah, so when he's saying, oh, I, di I didn't get paid, I do not believe it. Yeah, maybe he got paid in chicken from uh, Mr. Cameron McDonald at Swiss Chalet. Oh, okay, okay. It, it wasn't just fake numbers. Uh, you, you made up uh, Mr. Morov Beige Inc. for uh, Mr. Uh, Morov's experience. The company doesn't even exist. <gasps> Do you agree with that? <laughs> yeah, the mistake there was it was, should have been Project One instead of his name. The, com the thing is, I was again, it doesn't matter about whether it's the bullet points or the, I was making it compliant. If the same process happens, whether it's making, uh, adding, they they gave meetings to senior executives, they provided JAD sessions, it's the bullet points were in there. That's when you do the back and forth. And if it looks like it's too much of a stretch, with. you just don't do it. And, and then you... If it looks like it's too much of a stretch... And making it compliant? Okay, right there, right wow. there. Forget everything else he just said. Forget everything else he just said. If it looks like you're making it too much of a stretch, that automatically means he has done this with other resumes. Like, we all know it. Like, I'm not dumb here. But he's just admitted to it. He's saying that's his practice. So that means he's done this with who knows how, how many other resumes. So he's admitting to this now. For all to see, on other contracts, he's done this. He has fabricated resumes in order to make them fit. And he's indicated to us, this is what we do. Well, you know, I can't fabricate too much because then people will notice. Wow. Who did you back and forth I, with? With I the resume I didn't changing. on this case. I didn't on this case. I'm just talking typical process. I didn't you say did CBSA reject the deliverables and and the contract before or after Butler made mis misconduct uh, allegations on September 27th, back in uh, 2021. So Butler would have so December 23rd was when the termination email went to them with CBSA asking. So the timing would be that the accusations were made before the termination. There you go. That's the would, problem. Would you describe a cottage as like a, a under 100,000, two bedrooms and a chalet? What would you describe the difference between a cottage and chalet? And how did you know Mr. McDonald had a chalet and not a cottage? Because <laughs> in a meeting we had, he referenced the fact that he had a chalet once. And I, I don't know what the generic square footage is or bedrooms for either a cottage or chalet. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's different for all of them. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Barrett for five, then we'll finish with Mr. Kuzmerich for five. 
We're going to finish with Mr. Barry. What is the last invoice you submitted on Arrive Can work to the Government of Canada? I'm sorry, I do not have that. I can provide that for you. I didn't come here with information. I've already provided every kind of you, you didn't information come here with I had. Information that GC Strategies didn't do for work on Arrive Can, but build the taxpayers for it. Got it. Um, well, the answer is October 2023. I'm going to read you a transcript of a leaked audio file, um, and uh, it's a view. Quote, <laughs> we did the Arrive Can app, which is one that everybody has to use to come across the border in two months. And that has like 27 pages, 15 workflows, e-declarations, facial recognition, NFC capability of the passport, end quote. If it took you two months to do the work, why are you still billing taxpayers in October of this year? What? October 23 was not a Rive Can invoicing. But I'm pleased that you've suddenly uh, found me, the documents related to my question. The problem no, that we have here today is that all of my questions, we have to assume that you've lied about absolutely everything. Sir, I've never said to a witness in my parliamentary career that they have lied to a committee, but you just did it. So I'm not sure if you thought you were clever pulling a thesaurus off your shelf. Well, it's not a cottage, it's a chalet. It's embarrassing. What you're doing is disrespectful to members of this committee, and it's disrespectful, you know, frankly, to the government of Canada who is, um, is paying your rent. And taxpayers should be very concerned that a dollar has flowed from the government of Canada to your organization because everything you've said here today is absolutely unacceptable from a contractor for the government of Canada. You know, you, you... I haven't invoiced... Uh, sorry, I haven't invoiced no, the CBSA sir, since May. That was not a question. So I don't know. That so was October not a question. That was a doesn't make sense. In fact, Mr. Chair, can you please call the witness to order? Sure, time, Mr. Barrett. Please continue. Sir... I'm going to ask you some questions that we dealt with previously because um, we're going to see if we get different answers this time because that seems to be the pattern with you. Do you use relationships to get work from the Government of Canada? No, I do not. You've, and, and what is, see, so, see, sorry, what is, your, no, what is your interpretation of a relationship, please? Oh, my God. Whoa, this guy... Unbelievable. First of all, in all the time that we have been watching committee and, and, and we have never, ever heard the chair have to call the witness to order. Never. Number one. Number two, this guy just keeps digging that hole. What's your definition of a relationship? What, you think it's like a girlfriend that, that he's asking for? No, it's, it's an interpersonal relationship. With somebody, friends, colleagues, parents, siblings, whatever. Wow. What's your definition of relationship? Well, I guarantee you that he's he's trying to protect people in the government, hoping that they're going to protect him. Man, this whole thing is just falling down around everybody. Damn. Damn. Well, I mean, uh, I guess what is your your interpretation of a cottage versus a chalet? Where you know we have we have you meeting, we laughing. have records of you meeting at a hotel with the CIO for the government of Canada, and then you tell this committee that oh, I don't have any recollection of that. I've got to tell you, if I meet with the top person from an organization. Uh, I, I'm going to remember that meeting, particularly if I've had to comply with access to information records um, requests concerning that and then furnished that, that request. Sir, you're being dishonest and disingenuous in all of your answers to our questions. I appreciate that you're embarrassed about the work that you've done and about the things that you've said, but you are required to be honest when you come before a parliamentary committee. And this clever act that you're trying to put on is not fooling anyone. So I'm going to ask you some of these questions again. Have you ever met with government officials or anyone employed by government in a private residence? Yes or no? Yes. Oh! <gasps> wow, you were right that the conservatives are just like driving at him and then he's like, oh, crap. Yeah, they just the bowl truth. him over. Yeah. They bowl him over. Wow. Good job, Barrett. That I that is so important. That is so important. Not the answer itself, but but the fact that Barrett has forced him 
to recant his previous statement. That's a demonstrated flat out lie that he said before. That is so important. Barrett has other questions. Okay, what is the nature of that meeting? I'm, I'm assuming that they, I don't know the exact meaning you're referencing. I have not like I've had hundreds of these things. The truth is, I don't know which one you're talking about. I, I've, <laughs> I've had so many that I don't remember. I've had so many of these meetings that I said no to before. Wow. That I don't remember. Damn. Well, they, they have them on the ropes here. Let's let's see where this goes. I'll try not to interrupt. I want to know about all, I want to know about all of them. I I don't know which one you're. Sorry, I cannot comment. If you could direct your exact question to me in writing, I'm more than happy to respond. Sir, you're here providing oral answers to oral questions for a parliament a standing I don't, committee I don't of the House have of the Commons. Answer. Well, your answer sorry, changes. I don't have the answer. So your 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 answer changes. I've got about a minute left in time, and I'm I'm interested. Um, I'm interested in, in what precision we can get on any of that. You've had so many meetings with government officials in their private residences outside of, of working hours that you can't even remember. You can't remember how much money you were paid to work on the Arrive Can app. You can't remember meetings that you had in hotels with the chief officials for information technology for the government of Canada. I, I'm, I'm not sure what confidence your clients could have in you if you can't remember these very basic details. sir. I'm going to ask that you table for this parliamentary committee all bank records related to your business and the Government of Canada, that GC, GC Strategies, Government of Canada and Bottler. Anywhere that nexus exists, this committee, I would like you to table the bank records. Are you willing to do that? Yes or no, sir? Yes, so it's between the government, to myself, to Bottler. Is that what you're asking? Everything I'm, I'm, concerning... I'm asking, everything, I'm asking clarification on sure, your question. Please. Everything concerning... GC Strategies, the Government of Canada, uh, Cordex, Dalian, Bottler. So anywhere there's an intersection of any of those companies, the committee would like your bank records. You will furnish us with them in, within 48 hours? Oh, I'm not, I'm not prepared to do that. I'm sorry, okay. like, for what purpose? Mr. Chair, can you, can Mr. You please Chair, Mr. Chair, it's a private I, I, information. Mr. Chair, I move that the committee order the production of those documents. <gasps> Whoa! Whoa, whoa, whoa. Let's go. Get him. Wow. Get him. Barrett's on fire. Get him. Get him. Get him. I am very interested in this because if they can... Th here's the implications, people. This... Many of you probably already understand this. But here's the implication. If, if they get these bank records and if they show there are payments over and above the $112,000 on the dates that GC Strategies and Dalian are stating. Remember, Dalian stated that they've only done business with GC Strategies this one time. If there are anything over and above that, Dalian is now shown to be lying and is then in contempt of Parliament as well. Then the fraud expands to Dalian and Cordex. Okay? The investigation expands even further into Cordex and Dalian. This this has very big implications. Not just on, on, on Mr. Firth. As I said, remember I said he's window dressing. He is window dressing to all of this. This goes so much further than him. Man. Certainly. Do we have committee approval? I, I will interject. I assume like other sensitive documents, we will keep them within the committee. Correct. Yeah, we're not yeah un yes. un until, until, not un until, decided until or unless the committee decides otherwise. Yes, sir. Yeah. That sure, can will we just suspend for, for, yeah. for 30 seconds? So we're just going to suspend for a moment. Okay, so the liberals would like to have a little discussion here. Yeah, I'll bet they do. While we're waiting, want to say welcome to MP supporter to Eat Me. 
<laughs> nice. So what's probably going on is the liberals are caucusing and there's they're they're assessing what the damage could be if if this happens. And they're also assessing the damage of if they don't agree. Cuz here's the problem like there's no senior there's no senior liberals in this room. Um so this could have wide-reaching implications depending on how far this goes to the rest of the liberal caucus. So they're trying to decide, what do we do here? If we stand in the way, based on this testimony, we look terrible. We look absolutely terrible. But if we let this go, and there's wide-reaching implications to the, to the liberal government, that poses a significant problem. Right? Uh, can we get a like count? You got 1,274 likes. Great job, everybody. That definitely smashed the old record, which I believe was 1027. Oh, 1275, still going up. Still going up. So, um, uh, up, uh, up Duke Dales. Hey, Cypher Fox, regrets I couldn't make it earlier. No problem. Oh, here we go. I'm going to ask our clerk just to read that in to the record so we're all clear in agreement. Go ahead. Uh, my understanding is that the committee send for uh, all bank records related to the business of GC Strategies, where there is an intersection between GC Strategies, the Government of Canada, Cordix, Dalian, and Butler, um, and that the uh, Documents pro be provided to the clerk of the committee by Monday, November 6th, 2023 at noon. Christian Firth probably having a heart attack. Clear, right Mr. Firth? Yep, I heard that. That is an order of the committee. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Barrett. We will now finish up with Mr. Kuzmirchuk for five minutes, please. Okay, for the people that have seen this, is there anything else worthy of watching? Because I, I don't really have any interest in watching another liberal throw softballs at this guy so give me a give me a give, give me a give me a yes if there is uh something good okay so we see not too much nope okay i didn't think so i didn't think so before we wrap it up we're gonna thank shed dwelling hermit for five dollar super chat the liberal titanic is heading straight towards the conservative iceberg it sure is yeah yeah well you know what Someone said just finish it. It's only one more. We might as well, we might as well call this a complete uh, committee. So uh, I, I am inclined to finish it. Um, let's just. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Let's Obviously, we've heard a lot of uh, a lot of things today. Um, some really interesting testimony and, and information that have been established. I, I want to provide you the opportunity to to tell us, explain to us, um, the actions of of Butler AI uh, from your vantage point. Um, we see, for example, Butler AI has tape recorded you. Um, wow, they really? They have asked you to sign an NDA. Uh, they have reported asshole. on misconduct and Notice potential the fraud get in the to way, the though. CBSA. In fact, presented a detailed report uh, no, on the that. Get in the way and they've also the bank gone directly uh. to, uh, to the media, and they've brought their allegations here to this committee. Um, help us explain those actions uh, from your vantage point, Are we uh, and, and how we should be viewing those those actions wow well first of all it's uh it's very discouraging when you're trying to work with a small canadian company to try to get them contracts with the federal government to actually solve real problems that oh, yeah, uh, a lot of canadians are actually facing you do that with good intentions oh you come on work oh, gross for two years on trying to get them get the foot in the door get them with the meetings they need and again at that point they have to close the door but this, the truth is um, I feel like it's it's it's, it's been a little bit a bit traumatic so understanding the fact that Ryan voice recordings, very, very uh, text that. messages, uh, again, all good intentions, even trying to get them on their own vehicle to eliminate our Ronda, company. <laughs> Ronda so there will be no third much. party. There'll be no ghost contract and whatever the terminology was that was brought up. The truth is, I did everything I could to get them contracts to get them get the word out there get them to help canadians and get them on their own and supply arrangements so they could go direct and, and then none of these accusations would ever happen again 
I, I mean, you can understand from my perspective, I'm seeing a company, Butler AI, that's putting everything on the line, uh, their reputation, their integrity. They've gone public with this. Yes, um, they are. I'm trying to understand from va your vantage point why they would do that. Exactly. I think they, it, there was good intentions when we first started the pilot to get the work done. That's why the first two deliverables were done on time and they were paid. I think there was the understanding that things were failing and that things weren't working. Those four deliverables, again, they were terminated December 23rd. And in my experience, termination is usually for performance. Um, so the fact that they went dark for nearly two months, it seemed like they were scrambling to get the last four deliverables drafted up for submission because, again, they whether they had, I helped them get a line of credit. So whether they were over leveraged and they needed the last four remaining, I'm not sure what it was. But being in debt typically makes things a little bit more real. And at that point, you become desperate. Wow. Um, the Butler AI also alleges that uh, Cameron McDonald, who was the uh, director general at CVSA at the time, was providing real time coaching by text message while you were pitching Butler AI to the then president Asofsky uh, and senior leadership at CBSA. Did that happen? There was communication be between Mr. McDonald, Butler and myself. This was, again, Mr. McDonald identified that there's a real problem and this needed to have, uh, I think he just wanted this young Canadian company to be successful <laughs> and understood Jeez. that there's certain ways. Gross. And he was just trying, doing his best in my understanding to help out Butler. Is, is that, that a conflict of interest <sighs> to have an official coaching you to basically say the right things to get the, the bid through, to get the deal? Yes, it is. And is that I, be I, believe, I, I believe that there were, the intentions were to help with the presentation, but by no mean at that point, the, the president still needs to like the software. There's, there's more things to that. Remember, just that there Christian still needs to be understanding the software to, and making uh, sure that it's a to, fit within the organization. Chalet, but is right? that a so. regular thing? I mean, is that a regular thing for an inside official to be coaching a company on what to say, pitching their product to other officials, senior officials? Is that normal? I, I can't comment on what's normal. It, it, it's, did, did Mr. Cameron, I'm, not, I'm not in everybody's meeting. Did Sorry. Mr. Cameron McDonald tell you to inflate the CV that you submitted? No, he did not. Who told you to inflate the CV that you submitted to change the numbers? Who asked you to do that? Did anyone nobody, ask you to do that? No, nobody did that. that. Again, that's part of my process for when I'm doing the resume that's submission. Part of my process. Okay. Wow. And then one final question. I know you answered this before, but why did Butler AI uh, need uh, GC strategies? Why couldn't they just contract or work directly with CBSA or, or, or Dalian and Cortex? Why did they need uh, GC strategies? So they were not a qualified vendor. So that's why okay. we aligned ourselves originally. So okay. anytime they wanted to work with the federal government, they could have worked through us. Okay. How much time, uh, Chair? That's it. That's it. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Kusmir. Chuck, before I ask if we adjourn, I know Mr. Genuas said something, then Mr. Zawari. Go yeah. ahead quickly, please, because uh, we're short on time. Chair, I know, I know uh, we're quick on time today, but I think you'll probably find agreement for the committee to, uh, to bring Mr. Firth back uh, for another two hours. Uh, and uh, let's just skip a step and say to summon him back for two hours uh, to uh, continue this important line of questioning. Wow. <laughs> skip a step and go right to yeah. summoning, yeah. yeah. As date and time determined by the chair as before? Yeah, yeah. It's determined yeah. by the Is chair. That, we trust we each other. with that, Colin? I will arrange that with the clerk and Mr. It's Clark. not over, Christian. Mr. This is Shari, just the start. Ahead, yeah, on the same thing, we would like to request to call uh, Mr. Cameron McDonald back to come to back to the committee for two hours as well. He is coming, I think it's next week. He's coming, He's coming Tuesday, next actually. Week. Oh, okay, yeah. great. Tuesday, great. Cameron McDonald. Oh, no worries. Uh, there you go. That most at the end of the meeting when he's Sorry, here. Sorry, uh, please. <laughs> uh, well. uh, sorry. Bef attention, please. Mr. Firth, thanks for your time. Oh, I think I see Mr. Souza. But uh, there were several requests for information from you. There was one on the versions of the resume. Okay. That wow. was gross. I really wish we ended on Barrett. Wow. Yeah. That, but that was disgusting, the way he was talking. Like, he was the hero. It's important, though. I know it's important, but it's so gross. It is gross. It is. Um, but it just shows, like, you know, the, 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 the softballs that the liberals have been giving. And it's important that, that everyone see this. And 
you know, people, people will comment on even hearing Justin Trudeau speak. And believe me, we know. We know he's like nails on a tr- chalkboard. But it's important that people hear it. Um, because you need to understand and hear what he's saying so you can contrast that back to what the conservatives are saying. And when you're having these conversations out there with people that you know that vote liberal, that don't follow this stuff as close as you do, you know what the liberal talking points are and then you know how to address them. So it's important to understand what is being said. Because remember, the goal is to get this con- that get these conservatives into government. Because so far, they're the ones that are talking truthfully, honestly, and with common sense. If at some point they start talking without any integrity and without common sense, you better believe that Northern Perspective is going to be calling that out. Because we don't align to party, we align to platform and uh, what is going to be the good of all Canadians. Before we get any deeper, I want to say thank you to Glenn Stewart for a $2 super chat. He hit an iceberg and is sinking fast. Yeah. 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 So, um, and thank you to those that, uh, that are, you know, trying to Im- implore people to share this video, like this video, please share it. Um, we know it's on almost four hour stream, but, uh, this is important. Canadians need to see this stuff. Yeah. And I, I hope everybody enjoyed the commentary. I hope it was helpful. Um, we, we try to make it as helpful as possible for everybody. We, we hope you learn something every stream. Uh, we hope we start learn something every stream because we want to get better at doing this and uh, providing a, a better, uh, a better service to the Canadians that watch us. So thank you very much. Thank you everyone to your, to your donations. And, uh, we will not be recording an episode tonight, obviously. Um, but we continue to watch the uh, Rive Can scandal and we will continue to, uh, to comment on it and um, stay tuned. There's much, much more to come. This is just getting started. So thank you, everybody, and have a good night. Good night.